our thought experiment is in a universe that's a Google Plex meters across, are there doppelgangers? Uh -huh. Now you see, right, well, how many possible states are there? How many possible ways are there to describe this cubic meter of space? I think it's almost implausible to suggest that in what I call a Google Plissian universe, that your doppelganger could not exist. Welcome, everyone, to the Cartesian Cafe. I'm your host, Tim Nguyen. Today, we're very lucky to have Antonio Padilla here with us. Tony is a theoretical physicist and cosmologist at the University of Nottingham. He serves as the associate director of the Nottingham Center of Gravity. And in 2016, Tony shared the Buchalter Cosmology Prize for his work on the cosmological constant. Tony is also a star of the Numberphile YouTube channel, where his videos have received millions of views. And he is also the author of the book, Fantastic Numbers and Where to Find Them, A Cosmic Quest from Zero to Infinity. Welcome, Tony. How are you doing today? Doing well, Tim. Doing well. Nice to, nice to meet you. Yeah, great to have you here. Uh, so, Tony, you're a physicist with very visible interest in mathematics. Why don't we start off by you uh, telling us about that uh, set of interests and how you got involved in both math and physics and how you ended up deciding on the balance between the two that uh, you have now? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess my interest goes particularly to numbers goes right back to when I was a kid. I mean, you know, once I realized that I wasn't going to be a professional footballer or I guess soccer player, as, as you guys would call it over there, um, you know, my, I went I sort of was drawn towards my other great love, which was which was numbers and, and, and maths. Um, and that that really blossomed. And, and it sort of, you know, I remember my mom and dad bought me this um I talk about this in, in the book actually, but this giant this giant English dictionary, this Collins English dictionary, one of these huge ones, uh, for Christmas one year. And I was like, well, why, why have you bought me this? This is like numbers. Uh, this I'm, I'm into numbers and this is more about words. So of course I had a choice. Do I look up I knew it wouldn't have the name of any footballers in it? So I saw, okay, I'll look up some big numbers in it. So I started going through the book looking up like a million, a billion, you know, and then and then eventually I got up to a centillion, which in the British system was a one with their uh, six hundred zeros after I thought, oh, this is so cool. So this I was already drawn to big numbers even at that very young age. Uh, I think that's as far as it went in, in, in that particular thing. I never got to a Google or a Googleplex or any of those cool things. Um yeah, and, and then that sort of blossomed. I went to university, did maths at uni, and um, but I had quite a sort of epiphany there as well, which is probably the moment that I started to to turn a little bit towards physics. And that was um, it was one of the one of the first assessments that I'd done, and it's very much a pure maths assessment. And you know, the the uh, I got zero in it, right? And I'd always been pretty pretty good at maths so I suddenly got this zero I was like wow this is this is this is horrendous uh, uh, why have I got zero and um I hadn't actually my argument was fine it said it was you know it was a it was a pure maths argument and, and, and you had to go through proofs and, and so on and so forth and um you know the the gist of my argument was absolutely fine you know I said this implies this implies this implies this and the argument was was okay and uh so I asked the you know the professor like well, you know, well, well why have you given me zero then and he said well I don't like how you've laid it out on the piece of paper. He didn't literally didn't like where I'd put the implied sides on the piece of paper. He just didn't like the layout. I mean, it was perfectly logical, but he did not like the layout. And I was like, okay, this is a little bit too pedantic for me, but I kind of get it. He was trying to instill in me this, this kind of, you know, this mathematical pedantry that's really, really important if you're a pure mathematician. But I guess at that moment, I realized I was probably going to be more of a sort of applied mathematician stroke physicist. Um, and I realized then that that when I was going to play around with numbers that I needed them to have like a little bit of personality um, I needed to bring them alive, alive somehow. Um, and I think that's where I was drawn towards physics and especially theoretical physics where and, and really that that's what really inter interests me you know, the interplay of numbers and physics and, and how maths can can impact on how can they, how it can describe the physical world and how we use maths to do that. So I really live at that sort of interface of the two and that, that was my journey to towards that point wow uh but <laughs> just to rewind a bit a zero i mean you didn't even get partial credit was this was this like one question or were there many questions it was the whole it was the whole um it was the, it was the whole um assessment it's quite funny because i was reading a book i wouldn't say it was five but 
uh, recently by, by, by a mathematician and they actually mentioned the, the name of the of the guy who had given me that zero and I sort of like came over in this cold sweat to like get the, the memory of it. So I think it's quite an eminent mathematician, but it, it was just a difference in style. As I said, they came very much came from the pure maths background and I was like a, a bit more of a mathematician, a bit more of a, a physicist at heart, I think. And, you know, with that brings a certain amount of recklessness, but hopefully not too much, um, too much for them, I guess. <laughs> mm. um, so, so, although it seems that you, you've you've been able to keep your interest in, in mathematics, it didn't scar you for life. Uh, you, you've uh, been able to uh, become a star on number file and, and also write a math book. So, how did how did that uh, come back into your life? Well, it never went away, really. I mean, as I said, I was I was very much I'd always loved it, and you know the the kind of physics that I do, theoretical physics. You know, we're dealing with maths all the time. We're using maths to try to describe the physical world. And there's a whole debate about whether maths should be able to describe the physical world. Of course, it seems to do it really well. But whether it should is, is another matter. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so, so I'd always been playing with maths anyway. So it wasn't actually, it's not like a huge departure. So suddenly started um, making YouTube videos that maybe, you know, involve numbers. But actually, one of the, I think the feature of both video of my videos and, and also my book of course is that is that when I, when i talk about some of these numbers so like for example graham's number or something like that you know you can talk about the mathematics behind it and, and the interesting maths you know this wonderful large number and the proof you know the, the ramsey the, you know the ideas in ramsey theory which is a branch of mathematics that that it's related to all these things but what i really like to do is i, I like to sort of try to always think about well, how can I describe this in our world? How can I relate this number, which is so far removed from anything you would think about in any day-to-day -day existence? How can I try to squeeze it into our world? And what's the physics? What's the wild physics that I can use to describe that? And invariably, I end up talking about black holes whenever I start doing that. So you, it's kind of like the most extremes of numbers are always going to lead you to the most extremes of physics. So I think in the number file videos, that, that's that's a theme. I think I, think I often end up doing that. Um, how we ended up doing number file that was i mean brady who makes the videos he he was he was based locally i was really lucky to that, that was the case um in nottingham and uh yeah so he, i heard about this guy who was making youtube videos and i kind of liked the idea so my first one was actually it was a 60 symbols not a number file video where we were we were doing a penalty shootout with this new new ball that they were using at the world cup and I ended up going in goal for this penalty shootout and I had a really bad performance. I was rubbish. And everybody, of course, is making the comments on Twitter about how bad the goalkeeper is. And it was really embarrassing, but but it didn't scar me too much. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> I see. Hmm. Um, maybe let's just linger a little bit about uh, in terms of the math and physics stuff, because, um, you know, I, I, I like math and, and, and physics uh, very much myself. I ended up going more on the uh, mathematics route. That's where my my Ph.D. is. Um, well, a lot of physics is, is, is of course, not very rigorous. I, I'm just curious how you how you balance that tension uh, sometimes. You know, I, I do very much like a clean and, and rock solid proof. And also kind of the, the I mean, there's an aesthetic. I, I do like the concreteness of physics, but sometimes I also like the, the pure distilled beauty of mathematics. I'm curious where you fall on that sp spectrum in terms of like mathematical, uh, you know, just clean definition, no ambiguity, whereas, you know, physics is sometimes a little more, I'm just going to prove something by this, uh, I'm going to walk through this, this forest, do a calculation, and that's, that's my proof, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess this is the age old question about how much you should be driven by beauty in, uh, in physics, of course, like, mm -hmm. I, I, I also, you get a kick out of mathematical beauty, mathematical elegance, and oh my gosh, that, that's almost too pretty not to be right. And of course, Dirac, the great Paul Dirac, famously, that that was sort of, I think the Dirac equation itself, and he, you know the existence of antiparticles and all of this, all followed because he he just felt that his equation was too beautiful to not be correct. <laughs> this is the amazing thing, and actually it is correct. But as, but, but at the time it was it was it was revolutionary some of the ideas he was saying. But it was the beauty of the mathematics that he thought this is just too nice not to be true. Now of course, you should never, as a physicist, you know mathematics is not the ultimate arbiter right it's not as a physicist what is the ultimate arbiter it's it's experiments and observation and so you've always got to respect that as frustrating as that can sometimes be especially if the observations and the experiments don't quite agree with the predictions of your theory 
but that's the ultimate arbiter and i think that that's that's the that's the it kind of grounds you in some respects um so yes there, there is elegance and beauty in mathematics which we all admire um but ultimately you've always got to respect experiments so, so in some sense that's the bit of rigor that's that we have in physics if you like it's it's experiments and observation they 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 that's where the rigor really comes and if we can get our mathematics to work with that then i think most quizzes are reasonably happy with that because ultimately experiments and observation is 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 king Hopefully. yeah although that's that's a, that's a good point because you know in mathematics you're you're of course uh driven solely by by the mathematics itself as as a theoretical physicist you're in some sense like a mathematician too because you are motivated by the theory and the equations so there's sort of like this this phase where people are proposing lots of different models and then they later get pruned by which one lines up with the ex experiments but but that's sort of like an uh, that's like a, a post dictum right you're while you're coming up with your model you're much more like a mathematician you're not actively uh you know maybe you're, you're not at that stage constrained by by the experiments because that that comes later if your if your model is 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 theoretical and, and maybe is provisional because it, it 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 hasn't been confirmed or disconfirmed yet, right? So there there is kind of a similarity in in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think actually, you know, they can learn from each other in this in this respect as well. So so you know, one of the things that we're thinking about at the moment, which you know, I'm going to detail because it's kind of it's kind of not out there yet. But but we're um, you know we're trying to understand aspects of of sort of number theory and divergent and divergent series and things like that, which are very much mathematics. But trying to understand them from from physics, it's, it's it's kind of the the results of physics which are which you're using to try to actually is this telling me something about numbers themselves? You know, of course you might you're making a leap there, which is that there is a connection between nature and mathematics, which is you're not necessarily entitled to make. But if you choose to make it, you can then ask, what can I learn? And this is one of the interesting things that you can do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, of course, we, we can have an entire conversation about the nature of mathematics and reality and physics. But uh, but anyways, why don't we why don't we go ahead and maybe uh, get closer to, to the main topic of today? Um, we're going to talk about various aspects of your book. Maybe actually, why don't you give the backstory a little bit about how you ended up uh, writing your book? What, what was your motivation before we we dive in? So, so I'd always I'd always wanted to write a, a popular science book. So it'd always been something that, that I'd been keen on doing. And actually, the 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 kind of the thing that finally led to, to it happening was is, is actually quite it's, it's quite a sad story actually. So so a friend of mine had taken ill with with uh, with cancer, and I I was I was trying to raise money. A lot of us were trying to raise money to get some treatment for him. Um, and one of the things I did is I decided to start giving lectures in and around and I would do a collection, do, give these public lectures and, and do collections afterwards. And I actually managed to raise quite a bit of money that way. Um, but the, the talk I was giving um, at those lectures was, was about the interplay of maths and, 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 and numbers and extreme physics. And as I was giving these lectures and it, you know, people were responding quite well to it, I realized that, well, actually this, this could um be the seed for, for a book this could work as a book and uh so that that was where it started really and and then randomly uh, i was approached by a publisher and it kind of blossomed from there uh but but yeah in some sense it's a tribute to to my mate hendo that that that, that this happened he's he's not with us anymore we, we we you know we couldn't we couldn't save him but but this is kind of in some sense the book is 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 a tribute to him oh wow okay well, i didn't realize there was such a, a personal backstory to that um Okay, well, why don't we uh, um, discuss what we're going to talk about today? Um, so, as we planned out, um, we were going to talk about one of the uh, overarching themes of your book, which is um, thinking about numbers in, say, physically uh, extreme scenarios. Now, your book also goes into mathematically extreme scenarios, things like uh, Graham's number and tree three, but for the for the, for the purposes of this discussion, I thought we would stay focused on the uh, physics aspects. And I think this is uh, a um, uh, refreshing intellectual pursuit because as theoreticians, we're not always so accustomed to thinking about the exact values of numbers. So maybe let me start off with, with a joke that I remember hearing as a student. So uh, when you're a kid, uh, you first learn, say, uh, when you're learning fractions that pi is 22 over seven. And then when you become a student, you learn that pi is 3.14159, et cetera, et cetera. And you can learn all the techniques 
to compute the decimals expansion of pi to as far as you need. And then when you become a researcher, you set pi equals to one because it's just some constant whose value you don't care about. Right. And, right. And, there, and, and there's a version of this also in physics, like the speed of light. When you're when you're very young, it's just some immeasurably large quantity. When you're a student, you learn that it's roughly three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And then when you become a professional physicist, you work in natural units where C is equal to one. Right. So uh, so so, you know, uh, we, 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 at least I and maybe yourself, too, we, we, we just sort of ignore the values of these constants. And I think it's good to sort of maybe uh, take a step back and, and kind of remember what, what the, you know, the, the physics and what these numbers actually uh, mean. Right. So so I, I and then we're going to go kind of further in that direction, because your book brings up a lot of uh, kind of cute puzzles and ideas uh, thinking about these numbers. And in fact, uh, a lot of modern physics is, is worried about some of, you know, some of the, I guess, uh, let's say, uh, peculiarities of, of these numbers. So, so that's, that's the topic. So uh, how, how does that sound? Yeah, that's good. It's, it's actually quite funny because when I was preparing for this, for this, uh, for doing this, I, I started writing down some equations and I was like, oh no, I forgot the factors of C. He's going to get upset about the factors of C. Uh, so yeah, I was setting it to one left, right and centre, then panicked because I have no idea what the equations look like when the C's are back in there. So, so sure. yeah, it's it. right. It's the same thing with H bar. Uh, anyways, let me oh, yeah, actually. That's it. That's it. Okay. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me actually, let, let me just write a an actual outline just so we we uh, have more of a a clear picture of what's going on. So um, maybe the first thing we'll talk about is to uh, get familiar with physical values. So things like uh, length scales, time scales, multiplicity, you know, how big things are, how many, you know, uh, protons, neutrons are, things like that. And also maybe to understand how uh, we ascertain those numbers, because I've personally never uh, uh, looked into how, how physicists know these, these sort of extraordinary quantities. Um, and then uh, next after that, I thought we could uh, discuss the first, uh, this first puzzle, uh, one of them, one of the puzzles that are in your book, which is how likely is it to find your doppelganger? So this is kind of a, an interesting thought experiment, right? Because you, you know, you and I, we're all just a, a collection of atoms uh, in, in some very reductionistic sense. And then it becomes a, a, a combinatorial problem in this extreme limit of, of how likely is it to find another copy of, of you, right? So, so this, this ultimately boils down to uh, some discussion of entropy, which is basically uh, a notion of multiplicity. Uh, so I, ha I had a previous episode where we, where we had a discussion on thermodynamics, so people can, can watch that if they need a review of what entropy is. But, well, you know, we'll, we'll also review it as well. And, and, of, and the other um, aspect of this is how big and, and even how many universes there are. Right. So, so it's, it's sort of like, you know, if you were just a random collection of atoms, what, what is the, what is the likelihood that if we, you know, just shook that bag and, and sort of uh, many, many times, what, what are the odds that, that twice there will be you here and you somewhere else. Right. <laughs> so that's, a, that's an interesting uh, a thought. So we'll, we'll go into the physics of that. So this is sort of like the outline of the ingredients and, and, and yeah, I guess in, in some philosophical sense, this is also just kind of fun to think about. Um, so this is also where kind of thinking about very big numbers, of course, uh, comes into play. And then finally, the, the third topic that I thought we'd discuss is this second puzzle, which is a very important puzzle. Uh, it goes by the name of naturalness. Right. And that's basically this aesthetic principle in physics that ratios, say, between physical constants shouldn't be too large. They should be natural or order one. It, it seems very conspiratorial if you have... Uh, very large ratios that sort of align themselves in some way to, 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 to give you some very fine-tuned number, right? And somehow uh, physicists find that uh, kind of aesthetically displeasing. So, so that, that, that is the problem of naturalness. And the instance in which we're going to discuss this is, say, the cosmological constant, right? Why, why is it a 
uh, such a small non-zero number. You know, zero is a very nice number, and there are many ways things could be zero. But if you're very, very, very small and not zero, that that's that's a little fishy, right? So, so that's 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 the sense in which we're going to talk about these. Uh, I'm sorry. Even zero would be a problem with the cosmological constant. Actually, that that's still difficult. But yeah, you're right. So okay. Well, zero, but yeah. Uh, as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, well, if zero is a problem, it's a problem for different reasons than than being mathematically uh, an anomaly. Let's say, or, or yeah. Um, okay. And then and then yeah. So so again, this is kind of continuing the theme of of sort of exotic or 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 extreme numbers, either large or small, which which your which your book goes into. Um, and then from there we can we can kind of uh, play around with things. We can maybe talk about the anthropic principle, which is uh, uh, kind of uh, this this idea that maybe numbers are the way they are because because well we're living and we're, we're available we're, we are existing beings that can observe these numbers. So that puts a constraint uh, on those numbers after the fact. But by the very fact that we exist, then these numbers maybe have to be uh, exotic in the way that they are. Okay, so that that's an interesting uh, thing to discuss, and it's gotten, uh, I guess, uh, there's various controversial aspects which maybe we can get into, and then uh, and then I thought finally uh, we could maybe even talk about some of your work on something called vacuum energy uh, sequestering, which uh, I have no idea what it is, but I remember reading your book and and you said that you've done quite a bit of work on this to explain why the cosmological constant is the way it is, and so maybe we could get some of your insights on that. Okay, so, cool. Sounds, all right, how does it sound? Good. So, Tony, why don't you tell us about some some uh, physical quantities and and how we know what 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 these numbers are? Yeah, so I mean, guess where should we start? I mean, the uh, the size of the universe would be one, I suppose, right? Which is which is one thing you could ask about. Um, so, yeah, how do we know the size of the universe? Well, I guess immediately you've got to you've got to start asking, you know. You know, what do I mean by the universe, right? So, so I guess in this context, we'll mean the observable universe, which is kind of as as far as as, as the eye can see, literally, because there's a, there's a because light travels at a finite speed. Uh, there's a limit on, on on how far light could have traveled in a, in a finite time, and so that that kind of puts a, a, a you know if the universe had a beginning, which we believe it did um because otherwise this, well we could go into why that is but that's another question uh, but, but we, if we assume the universe had a beginning then then, then we know that um that the universe would have there'd be a finite re regime around us around which we 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 can only interact with that, that we can only see things from this region because light has a finite speed so i mean immediately the way we start sort of measuring uh distances and you know the, the way we get an, a notion of size in the universe we use something called standard candles which are you know things that that the sort of you know objects like a certain type of stars or, or, or you know certain types of you know stellar object you know sort of astrophysical objects which which behave in a nice way, okay, behave in a characteristic way. You know, so for example, there's these things called cepheids, and these are the type of star, and they they uh, you know they they pulsate. Uh, you know, the, the the brightness will pulsate, and it does so in a very regular pattern based on you know the sort of properties of the star. And so when we can see, we can measure the time for these pulsa you know, these pulsations, and we know how bright the star actually is. Okay. But then we see how bright it looks to us. And from there we can extract the actual distance. Right. So we, we know how bright it is because we can measure the, you know, the time for these, how, how often it pulsates. That's characteristic, a, a, a property of the star which we can relate to its true brightness. Then we see the brightness that we see, and we see, well, actually, it looks this bright. We know it's actually that bright. So we can from there we know we know how the how the brightness will fall off as a measure of distance and then we can infer the distance. So that's how we measure dis, you know these these distances to to very distant objects. That's how we can work them out. Oh, is there so something we, you said it was Cepheids? Can you can you write that name on the iPad? I, I think I've seen this name before, but I don't know how to spell it. Yeah, so Cepheid. I see. So so, is an I see. Is that a particular kind of star? Like for example, like our own star, the Sun. It doesn't pulsate as far as i no, know no. right okay okay so we're lucky in that sense that you know if our star if our own sun was that far well if it was far away enough and we could still uh, i don't know observe it or whatnot that wouldn't give us a clue this the same clue as this cepheid it sounds like no 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 so uh, obviously you know so what we do is we 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 observe nearby cepheids and extrapolate mm. infer these these nice properties from those nearby guys and then we see the distant ones 
and then use them with our knowledge of the nearby ones to, to sort of work out the distance. But supernova are another example of what we call a standard candle, which is things that we think are behaving in a very standard way. And so, you know, because we know how they behave and we know what they're, we can then infer what their real brightness is. When we see them at a distance, we can, you know, we and we compare their apparent brightness to their true brightness. We can measure distances that way. So it's not just Cepheus; it's supernova mm. as well. For example, yeah, maybe maybe just a devil's advocate because it sounds like what you're doing is you have a model for what a star or a nebula is, and that model tells you or predicts for you what the intrinsic uh, brightness is. Is there any chance that, that like, how do you know that that model is correct? In other in other words, you, you I remember once um, somebody came up to me uh, and we were chatting at a conference and said, I'll be heard there's these rumors that maybe supernova aren't standard candles, which would be a disaster for all, you know, this would be really bad, right? You know, a particular type of supernova, the type two supernova. But, but um, you know, so, so yeah, uh, there, there is, there is a, you know, I mean, I'm not an astronomer, so, so you know, I, I can't tell you how reliable those statements are, um, but they are based on those assumptions. And actually much of the measurements that we do, um, you know, when we measure things like the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is this radiation left over from the big bang that's another thing we use to measure the size and shape of the universe and and that again when you're inferring what the sort of cosmological parameters are that you get from those there are sometimes assumptions on the for example the theory of gravity that you're using that you're saying maybe einstein einstein's theory is is, is what applies and that might not be true and so, yes, so you always need to be aware of what your assumptions are going into this, some of these statements. And if those assumptions are not quite right, then you can infer, obviously, the wrong answers. Yeah, so, so again, this is, you know, this is there's a broad range of people working on these things. And my astronomer colleagues tell me that these are reliable objects to use, and I'm happy to believe that. <laughs> sure. My guess is what's, what's happening is that you have several of these uh, standard candles, and so uh, you can kind of validate them against each other, right? So you have maybe three or four or five of these different independent estimates of the age of the universe using completely independent methods, and if they all are roughly the same, then you can be confident that that you got the right answer. Exactly. Great. So what this allows you, so what this allows you to do anyway, particularly in the case of supernova, is you can now sort of look at um at an object and you can sort of you know how far away it is. And you, you know, you can you can also measure how fast it's moving. So the way you can do that is is you can say you can look at what's called the you know the Doppler effect. You can see it's red shifting, so that the wavelength of its light will change because it's moving away. It's the same effect that you have when a siren goes past you, right? Your ambulance goes past you, and you you hear, hear that change in pitch. That's the Doppler effect. And you get the same thing with light from distant stars. If lights are moving away from you, they'll get red shifted. And they get red shifted with this expansion of the universe. So, so one thing we can measure, we know how far these distant objects are. We can read off how fast they're moving, and then we can compare their velocity to their distance. And this gives you a measure of the, of the expansion rate of the universe, and it's called the Hubble rate. So this is the key parameter that, that we're trying to measure, which is how fast is space expanding? And this is how we do it. And so, 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 you know, we normally label it the Hubble rate today, which we label as as H naught. And I'll give you its its value if you just bear with me. Uh, I mean, th there is some debate over what this value is actually. There, there's some controversy. This is not not st standard answer. Um, so I'm going to give you a value that this is 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And megaparsec is a sort of astro astrophysical unit of distance. It's basically uh it's basically three times 10 to the 22 meters roughly so it's a huge astrophysical scale and this is measuring the rate at which the universe is expanding now supernova actually predicts a slightly higher value and um, cosmic microwave background radiation predicts a sort of lower value and is this this is really interesting tension in what the true value is so this is the thing that's telling us how fast is the universe expanding OK, now to sort of have an idea of, of, of what that is and how, how that all, all plays out, we have to know a little bit about how to measure space time distances. OK, so what how do we measure space time distances? Well, well, how do we measure distances, distances, never mind space time? How do we measure distances in space? Well, we use essentially kind of something like Pythagoras's theorem, right? So if you wanted to measure the distance between two points, so you've got like, let me just do a two dimensional example. So I've got. I've got two points here. So a point here and a point here, and I've got distance dx here and distance dy here. Then I know if I call this 
this distance along the hypotenuse ds, I know that ds squared is equal to dx squared plus dy squared. That's just, you know, the great Pythagoras, okay? Um, now, how does that, but that's distances in space. Now, how do I extrapolate that to, to distances? Well, before I do that, that's in two-dimensional space. If I want to extend this to three-dimensional space, if I include a, an extra direction, and you just add another like a dz squared. So you'd have a some other, you know, sort of imagine lifting this out of the out of the iPad a little bit, then it would be a dz, and I could still measure that distance. Actually, a yeah. question. What, what's this uh, auxiliary point where the, the right angle is? It sounds like you're you're doing some auxiliary or you have some auxiliary object here in this computation of ds. So if you like, I've got some coordinate directions, if you like. So in this picture, I've got some coordinate directions x and I've got a coordinate direction y. Uh, which measures some just orthogonal directions, you know, perpendicular directions. And then, um, and so if you like this point here, this point here is like at x, y, and this point here is at x plus dx and y plus dy. Does that make sense? Sure, sure, sure. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, that's, uh, so that's the kind of thing. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, I thought there was maybe some, some object there, but you, you were just explaining what a coordinate system is. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, okay. There's nothing more. Than that. Okay. Okay, then, okay. Of course, I, I could have a direction z which comes out of the page, and I extend dz in that direction, sure. and then I have a, a length is going to of this between the two points is then going to change again. I, and I have to pick up. Now, now, actually, I'm curious. Are you saying that in practice, astronomers can get away with just using the Pythagorean theorem and, and not using, say, Riemannian geometry? I mean, we do have a curved universe, but it's maybe only so slightly curved that that you you could just get away with Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so it's a good question. So one of the things that that, that we assume is that the um, that is that on very very large scales, so uh, you know, cos <clears throat> cosmological scales, that the that the universe is is homogeneous and, and isotropic. So homogeneous means that you know it's the same everywhere, and you know so it doesn't change its shape from point to point. And isotropic um, means that it's the same in all directions, whichever direction you look. And this very much, this immediately restricts the shape that the universe can have. So you're absolutely right. What I've written down there is Pythagoras' theorem in, in flat space, right? Okay, in a, in a you know, flat Euclidean space. But, you know, you could think, imagine, you know, the, the, the form of this for how to measure distances on a sphere, on a spherical object or, or a hyperbolic object, different shapes of objects, right? And then the formula is slightly different. And... What, what we know is, is that if, if we assume homogeneity and isotropy, so same everywhere, same in every direction, that there are only three types of spatial geometries that we can have. There are this, this flat one, which I've written down, there's the geometry on a sphere, and there's the geometry on a, on a hyperbolic geometry, which is like a saddle. Okay, it's shape of a saddle, but a three-dimensional analog of that. So those are the only three possibilities. And so, so um, anything else beyond that would break those assumptions. Um, could it be that? Well, there's good evidence that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic on, on very, very large scales. You know, we, we can see that from the cosmic microwave background radiation. We can, you know, so, so, you know we can see it from the distribution of stars and, ga and galaxies. So, so, so there is evidence of it. Uh, so, so and it's good, it, you know, mathematically it works well. So it's a good approximation. So yeah, it, it is an approximation, but it's an approximation which is a good approximation on, on the scale of, of the universe, you know, the very, very large distance scales. It's clearly not going to apply here on Earth. Right, because you know there's this this there's this laptop here, right? That's breaking the 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 uh, the homogeneity and the isotropy of the universe in that place. But on large scales, you can smooth that out. So it's kind of I am making that assumption. Okay, great. Um, so so so, so, so but now I can and now I want to extend this idea to space time. Okay, so I don't just want to think of distances in space. I want to think of distances in space time. Okay, so I, so I need to include time somewhere in the game. So. There's gonna, I'm going to include the time direction and a, and a different a change in time, which is from one point to the other, which is I'm going to call dt in the same way I called the change in the positions dx, dy, dz. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so what am I going to do? Well, what's your first guess? Well, you'd say, say, well, I'm going to include dt squared there. Maybe I should do that. Would be a good guess, but that's that that's wrong on so many levels, right? So one reason is obviously not right. It's just not right dimensionally. This is supposed to be measuring a distance, and you know, to state the obvious, time is not a distance, right? So I need to multiply it by a velocity to, to get a distance out of it. And so what better to use than the speed of light? Okay, so I, I multiply. I need to multiply this dt by, by c, the speed of light. So instead of having dt squared, I have c squared dt squared. So that's an obvious thing which will fix the dimensions. 
it's still wrong. Um, there's a little quirk is that I actually need a minus sign sitting in there in front of the DT squared. And the reason is it's to ensure that light is special, that light light, light has this really weird property that it, um, whilst it moves at the speed of light in space, it, uh, it doesn't move at all in space time. It's actually the, the DS squared for light is always zero. So it's literally just stays put in space time. It's a really weird thing. So you've got this thing which is galloping around <laughs> it's super fast in, in space, but in space time it stays put. And it's a really interesting property, actually. What what this the reason that this is what makes light so this is what makes relativity so wonderful that light has this property that it that it stays put in space time. It's almost like the the analog of the origin of of space, but in space time. So if you think about you know, one of the weird things about Pythagoras' theorem is that it's preserved under a, a, a rotation. If you rotate your coordinates, you don't change Pythagoras' theorem. It's the same theorem. And there's one point which doesn't change under that rotation, and that's the origin. If you rotate about the origin, then it, that stays put. Pythagoras' theorem stays put. Those are the two kind of special things. With space-time, what's the analog of rotations? Well, they're what we call Lorentz transformations. And the thing which stays put is light. And this is really important because these, these Lorentz transformations, they tell you how one observer who's moving relative to another perceives the world around them and, and, and how clocks are ticking and how space is, is sort of you know, compressed or not. And there's this wonderful property that, that the light just stays put. And this is, this is why you need that minus sign, but it's also just, just what makes light special. And actually that, that was the core of relativity from the heart, right? This is what it, you know, this is, people say that, that what's special about relativity, what's special about Einstein's ideas about relativity is that the speed of light is the, you know, the maximum speed is na in nature. Absolutely not. That's not what's special about the speed of light in Einstein's theory. What's special about the speed of light is that it is the speed of light. Now that might sound like an obvious thing, but what I mean is, is that it's, it, it's very much, everybody sees the speed of light as the same speed. So, so in some sense, it's unchanging. It, everybody sees it the same way. It's special, like the origin of coordinates. And so that's why you need that. That's related to the fact that you need this minus sign that light stays put when you think about space time. That's what makes it special. Yeah. Maybe just a historical aside. I, I think uh, in, in the development of, of relativity, Einstein was much more, um, approaching it had it from a thought experiment side you know bouncing light around moving trains etc cetera, etc cetera. i think it was minkowski who really geometrized this and, and put it on sort of the modern mathematical formulation uh, so this is going to be called yeah Min minkowski uh space and and just to reformulate uh what you said basically we want to look at transformations that preserve light cones yeah absolutely yeah. So, so, um, uh, right. So, so you, you're at some point and you sort of look at the, the trajectories, uh, the, uh given by, by light beams and you'll see that it indeed is just the light cone and, and the, uh, uh, because of this minus sign, the things which uh, travel at the speed of light do look like cones. And then you look at the transformations that preserve light cones. And then that's how you get sort of the geometry behind special relativity. So it's all about Minkowski and, uh, and, and, and Einstein, of course. So, so Minkowski was Einstein's tutor. He was his, his professor. Mm, mm, mm. He described Einstein as a lazy dog. So, uh, <laughs> and I, I think yeah, Einstein, all, yeah, and I think Einstein initially uh, resisted this uh, mathemat uh, mathematization, but of course later he had to embrace it because uh, he needed this and, and, and more to, to do general relativity. But I think initially he, he didn't like this, this way of thinking. Well, even the laws of electromagnetism, you know, before you start talking about general relativity, if you write them in in in, in this kind of four dimensional space time language, they're they're so, I mean, we talk about beauty, right? We talk about beauty of mathematics earlier. They're gorgeous. And I mean, if you write them in in the standard way that Einstein, uh, that Maxwell wrote them down, they're they're not horrendous, but they're they're a little bit messy. Write them with this this idea of four dimensional space time, and they are beautiful. Yes, and yes, yes. One, literally, tiny tiny equation and it's it's so elegant so this has to be right that's right that's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. we're now going to change this we're now going to change this so this is this is how how you measure space time distances in, in a very flat boring space time but our universe is not a flat boring space time it's it's an expanding evolving space time 
where the space itself is growing. So we have to add an ingredient here. We have to add something which allows space to grow. So you can see that you've got this spatial part here, this, this piece here, which I've just put the brackets around. That's kind of measuring the distance, that's kind of measuring the distances in space. And of course, we've got the time bit. And what I want to do is I want to allow that to grow, okay, over time. So I introduce what's called a, a scale factor. And let me just I introduce a little factor here, which is a squared of t. I just sit that in front of there. And what this a is, this is just a function of time which grows at, which grows over time. And it, what it means is, is that that spatial part of the distance, you know, the dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared, that contribution to the overall space-time distance grows with time. And that's the growth of space that we see in the expansion of the universe. Okay, so this is mathematically how we encode it. So when we talk about the distances to, to, to distant galaxies growing over time, what we're really saying is it's not that dx, dy, and dz are growing because they're just coordinate choices. They're staying the same. What's growing is a times that. Is the, There's this thing, this extra scale factor which causes those distances to scale over time and grow bigger and bigger. And we encode that in a. And so coming back to what this h naught is, this h naught is basically the rate at which that a grows. So we introduce something called the Hubble parameter, which is basically a dot over a, where dot is the differentiation with respect to time. Okay, mm -hmm. so the value of a dot over a today is this 68 kilometers per second per mm -hmm. mega parsec. Mm -hmm. Okay, so wow, massive digression. Sure, sure, <laughs> yeah. sure, sure. Uh, but how do we relate this to the age of the universe? Okay, so, so 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 now so now we have to think about a little bit about what what is this h? So we have this object which tells us a, which which tells us about you know the expansion rate of the universe. You know dynamically, what controls the rate at which the universe expands? Well, that's the matter and the and the stuff that lives in the space time. Okay, which you can relate to this h, these a dot over a via Einstein's equations. So you can put this metric, this we call this a metric, a space-time metric, a way of measuring distances in space-time. You can put that into Einstein's equations of general relativity. You can put in all the sources of matter that we see in our universe and some that we don't see. We'll come back to that. And you can ask, how does this, you know, how, how are they related? Okay, and there's an equation which tells us that, which is literally coming from Einstein's equation. And that's called the Friedman, that, that equation is called the Friedman equation. So I'm going to write down the Friedman equation. And again, it's just coming from Einstein's equation. So it tells us about this H, this, this expansion rate of the universe. So H squared is 8 pi G, G is Newton's constant, of course, over 3. And then I can relate that to the, the energy density of, of what's in the universe. So if I call rho M, that's the energy density of matter. So that's all the stars, uh, planets, all that stuff. But it, it'll also include dark matter. Actually, so there's this mysterious dark substance called dark matter, which we can't see, but we can feel its gravitational effects. And it behaves in, in many respects, just like ordinary matter in, in, in how it gravitates, but but we can't see it uh, you, know, you, know, it, you know, using sort of, I don't know, electromagnetism, for example, we, we can't interact with it that way. So we've got this row matter, which is the energy density of matter, dark matter and, and visible matter. And then we've got, I'm just, for the purpose of this, I'm just gonna include one other ingredient, which is which is dark energy. OK, now dark energy is another uh, mysterious unseen substance that lives in the universe. It pervades right across the universe. And it's the thing that actually causes the universe to to accelerate. And we can measure how much of these things there are in the proportion of these things by measuring, like I said, the cosmic microwave background radiation that can tell us how much matter and how much dark energy there is, what proportion. And so, so how do we do it? So one thing we can do is we can divide this whole equation by the current Hubble parameter. So this is the Hubble parameter at any point in time. We can divide it by its value today. So if I divide by its value today, I divide by um, H naught squared. Okay, so I'm dividing both sides by H naught squared. Okay, and then I'm gonna call, I'm gonna, I'm gonna identify this piece here. I'm gonna call it omega matter. And that's going to be, these are the fractional densities. So that's omega matter is 8 pi G rho M over 3 H naught squared. And then the other piece I'm going to call omega dark energy. Okay. And that's omega dark energy is 8 pi G rho dark energy 
and the three H naught squared. Okay, so these are these are just telling us the fraction of each ingredient you have in the universe. So today, so omega matter plus omega dark energy today is one, right? You can see that because H is H naught today, right? So this is the whole parameter today. So that makes the left-hand side of the equation one. So the right-hand side must also be one. So omega matter plus omega dark energy must be one today. But of course, at earlier points in time, it doesn't have to be one. It can change, it can change in time. Okay, in fact, we know how these things change in time because we know something about the properties of, of uh, dark energy and, 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 and matter. So matter, as time changes, it dilutes as the expansion of the universe grows. So as the expansion of the universe grows, matter will dilute. And the way we, and we know how it dilutes, it dilutes as a volume. So matter, so matter at some point in time, the value of this omega matter at some point in time is, you can relate it to its value today, and then divided by uh, some factor of a cubed. Okay, so this is just the properties of matter and how, how it scales over time. Okay, so matter will dilute. Dark energy, on the other hand, that doesn't dilute, that stays put over time. It's the same value, it takes the same value today as it took 100 years ago, as it took a billion years ago, it stays constant. So, so we have these two, so you've got these two cosmic ingredients, there's also radiation, but let's not worry about that. So you've got matter, which dilutes over time, and you've got dark energy, which stays pretty constant over time. And we know this because, again, we're using the cosmic microwave background radiation to sort of measure how the universe is evolving over time. We can measure these ingredients. OK, so from all of this, we can now calculate the age, the, you know, the, the, the size of the universe. So <clears throat> let me just put it all together. OK, so let me just put it all together. So I've got H squared over h naught squared is omega m today, that's its value today, divided by a cubed, plus omega dark energy uh, and its value today. And that doesn't scale. So this is the Friedman equation written in a different way. Now, the thing is, I know from observations that this guy is about 0.3, uh, and this guy is about 0.7. Okay, I know this. This is just what the observations tell me. OK, so from this, I can now calculate how big the universe is and how old it is. So let me show you how we do that. Well, we go back to our um, our metric. OK. OK, so let's let's just consider our metric. OK. And I want to measure, you know, how, how big the universe is. OK, so let's consider uh so let's look here's the metric so we want to measure how far light has traveled since the universe began okay that's the question how far has light traveled since the universe began well light don't remember light travel doesn't move in space time light doesn't move in space time it has the s squared equals zero okay so how far so let's just suppose it's moving along the x direction OK, so if it's only moving on the x direction, it has a dx, but it doesn't have a dy and it doesn't have a dz. Then from this equation, we can infer that dx is basically c dt over a. OK, that's how the change in if light is moving along and it changes by a distance dx, you can work out how that relates to the change in time. And that's the equation. OK, and now we want to ask how how far has it moved since the universe began? OK, so I now need to integrate both sides of this equation. So I integrate both sides of this equation over the entire history of the universe. OK, so let me do that. So I'm going to start off with the T Big Bang. OK, I'm going to start the integration at T Big Bang, right? The beginning of the universe and then to today, which is T zero. OK, and that's that should be related to the size of the universe. So whatever this is, this is what I'm going to call D universe. OK, so this is the formula that should give it to me. OK, now at the moment, this isn't particularly useful. But what I can do is I can I can change variables to A. So just to be pedantic, so it uh, I guess that's the, the difference in the size of the universe, but the size of the universe was zero at T Big Bang. Yeah, I'm asking what is the distance traveled by light since the Big Bang? Mm -hmm. That's what okay. I'm asking. Yeah, that's right. OK, there. OK, so that's what you're calling D universe. Yes, yes. Yeah, OK, OK. okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's just the by light. So let's. So now let's. Now let's. Now let's change variables on that integral. Okay. So I'm going to change variables to a. So I'm going to. I'm going to do a bit of calculus here. 
So instead of instead of um, instead of dt, I'm going to write dA divided by a dot. Because remember, dA is a dot dt. So dt is dA over a dot. Okay, so I can write that like that. That's the same interval. Just a bit of calculus. Um, now, what is what is a today? Well, I can just normalize things so that a today is one. Okay, I can say it's one. And what was A at the Big Bang? Well, it's zero. It's when the universe has shrunk to zero size. So that's zero, right? But now I can I can put all this together, right? So now let's put it all together. I've got zero, one. I've got C. I've got A dot. Well, A dots, don't forget, A dot over A is H. So I can relate that to H. Okay, so now I've got C. I can write that A squared H underneath DA. Okay, where well, what I've done here is I've replaced the a dot with a times h. Yeah, does this make sense? And now I can use the Friedman equation to get rid of h. Okay, so I've got the Friedman equation. The Friedman equation tells me that h is equal to h naught times the square root of 0 0.3 over a cubed plus 0 0.7, like so. That's what the Friedman equation tells me. I can plug that into that integral. And in the end, I mean, you can, I mean, I could do, I could do the maths, but there's probably not a lot of point in doing it. But when you, when you, when it all comes out in the wash, this will come out as 47, 47.6 uh, billion light years. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you do the calculation, right? So that's, this, that, that, that's how it's done. Uh, if you want the age of the universe, you can do exactly the same thing, but you just have to take, you just have to the integral. DT, the integrate DT between Big Bang and T0. And you do the same thing, change of variables, change to A, play the same game, and you get the age of the universe as around 13.8 mm. million. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those wow. are, that's where those numbers come from. Sorry, that's way too technical, I think. <laughs> no, no, no. I should make just one comment. So uh, in this, let's see. So Right, right, right. Okay, so there's 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 three cases for the Friedman equations: a uh, positive, zero, and negative curvature. You did the case with zero curvature, and I guess here this is also why it made sense to discuss the um, distance that light moved because uh, at every time at which a is not equal to zero, the the universe is infinite in extent, right? So that's not a meaningless, meaningful question to ask. What is the size of the universe? Um, I guess you could have done this computation in which um, curvature is positive, so the universe is always finite in extent, and then you could see what what the um, what the size of the the universe is there, right? You you could have yes. also done that computation. Yeah. So there are a few things that would change. You you have to include a curvature contribution to the Friedman equation as well if you do that. Uh, so that so the Friedman equation isn't just h squared e rho m, you know, eight pi g over three rho m plus rho dark energy. There's also a curvature contribution that you need to include, which is the curvature of that three dimensional space. So you can take all this into account, and yeah, you can you can do. But this is the meaningful. This is the meaningful. When people talk about the universe is you know, thirteen point eight billion years old or forty seven billion years billion light years across. This is this is the um, this is this is where these calculations. These are what they're saying. They're asking how far has light traveled since the universe began, which is the size of the observable universe. How far the universe extends beyond that is a completely other question. You're absolutely right. We can ask, We can. We can, what we could do is we could say there's a little bit of curvature, say there's a 1% curvature, then, 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 then at least we know that the universe, so if the universe were perfectly flat, then in principle it could go on forever beyond this 47 billion light years, right? It could definitely go on forever. That's a possibility. If it's a if it's if it's finite and it's curved like a sphere, like you're trying to suggest, then yeah, okay, it's it's it, it it's going to be finite then, right? But how far it's going to be bigger than forty seven billion light years? It's certainly bigger than that. How much bigger? Well, if it's if it's the curvature we know is is no bigger than than one percent, so that sphere is probably you could estimate roughly it could be about a hundred times larger than that. Okay, that that would be the rough estimate. So 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 so, so but 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 no more. Okay, so sorry, no, it, no, it must be at least a hundred times larger than that, no less. If it were less, then we'd we'd be measuring more. We'd we'd see more signs of curvature. We we haven't measured any curvature in it in our in our cosmological observations. So we don't. We've seen no evidence that the universe is bent round like a sphere. It might be, 
But if it is bent round like a sphere, it's very gentle bending, and we haven't been able to detect it yet. Mm. Okay, great. Um, all right, so so, and I guess of course, just maybe just one more point on this. We should we should probably move on. Um, this uh, calculation, uh, as with other calculations, assumes a certain model of the world that's accurate. In this case, that the Friedman equations are accurate, and I guess there's. Uh, Many other reasons to corroborate that the that the Friedman equations are accurate and, uh, enough so that we can trust these numbers. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one thing, yeah. So, so well, okay, it's a very good, very good point. We know that the Friedman equation is accurate down back to a, a time which we call Big Bang nuclear synthesis, which is just a you know something when the kind of it's when the new nuclei were sort of forming in the very early universe, and and um, and. We don't know how the free, so we know that from that point onwards, the Friedman equation basically has to match what I've written down to pretty good accuracy. What happened before that, we don't know. We have no real, the, 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 there is, there is, you, there is more, you know, room for, for maneuver prior to that. And of course, if you start feeding that in, then it could affect some of these calculations. However, bear in mind, this is at the points where, where you know, the scale factor of the universe is actually getting quite small. So the dominant calculations, you know, for these ages are going to come from the late universe, unless there's some weird singular behavior which does something really funky early on. Th th then you could get a much larger value. But generally, what's going to happen is is that these the, the, the late evolution is going to dominate these numbers. I see. Okay, great. Um, all right. So uh, we've we've uh, discussed, um, I guess, two two sets of of. Uh, extreme numbers, the the uh, the size of the observable universe and its age. Maybe we can quickly go over a few other numbers, just just for my own curiosity, just to round out this first section, which is um, let's say, how do we know the number of elementary particles in the universe? You hear some of these numbers like that. There's this many protons or atoms or electrons. Uh, do, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So ten, yeah, ten to the eighty atoms is is the, is the normal normally the number that you hear, roughly ten to the eighty. So okay. It, so it's kind of and we're going to use the Friedman equation to do, to do this, right? So, oh, really? So this, okay. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, in some respects, you, you can do this. There's a simplification that we that I think is convenient to make here, which is that let's assume all the universe is made up of hydrogen. Now, that's clearly not true, as me and you can testify, because we're not made up exclusively of hydrogen. It's quite a lot of hydrogen in us, but not exclusively so. But what we do know is that 75% of the universe is made up of hydrogen and roughly 25% of helium. There's, you know, barely anything anything else right so it's very much dominated by hydrogen and helium and actually hydrogen is the real dominant guy so you know to keep the calculation simple let's just assume it's all hydrogen which is not a terrible approximation anyway and we know this by the way because of observations of distant clouds and so on and so forth but let's assume that all the universe is made up of hydrogen atoms okay so the first thing we're going to need to know is what is the mass of the hydrogen atom okay so i'm just going to write that down so we'll keep that as a bank this for later, but the mass of the hydrogen atom is um, mass of hydrogen. So that's about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So that's the mass of the hydrogen atom. So that's fine. Bank that. Okay, so it's a really simple calculation. We're now just going to calculate what is the mass of the universe, and we're going to divide the two, and that's going to give us the number of particles. The number of okay, atoms. great. Really simple. Okay. Nothing okay. more complicated than that. Okay, okay. so... How are we going to calculate? Let's go really crude calculation. Okay, so we want to know what is the mass of the universe. Well, again, we're going to talk about the observable universe. Okay, so how do we work that out? Well, um, so let's 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 calculate a few things. So we need the volume of the universe. Okay, so the vol to calculate the mass of the universe, we're going to take the volume of the universe and multiply it by the density of atoms. Okay. So the volume of the universe is we're just going to imagine a giant sphere, okay, of radius d universe. Okay, so d universe is this 47 billion light years that we wrote down earlier. So it's 47 billion light years. Okay, the volume of such a universe would be four pi four thirds pi d cubed. Yeah, that's the volume. And we need to multiply that by the density of the hydrogen. So should I think of this, uh, thinking, uh, so this is uh, referring to the computation we should we just did. So I, I think of all the mass 
is being concentrated at the origin at this big bang singularity and then uh, as the universe expands all that mass is only contained into kind of the the amount of volume that light uh can 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 reach because otherwise you have this the complement of this d universe ball is, is infinite in extent in this infinitely large universe but it won't have any yeah. mass so so yeah so so, so so it doesn't really it's not really meaningful to talk about atoms uh, you know sort of right at the big bang they, 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 they can't oh, exist sure. yeah yeah it's just not a thing so once once atoms have settled down and the universe has evolved in, in, at the state where atoms can exist then, then you can ask the question how big is the universe well now it's 47 billion light years in terms of the observable realm and we can and we're assuming that the atoms have a certain density within that realm okay now that's a uniform density across the universe again through this assumption of homogeneity and isotropy okay so the same everywhere same in all directions and so so we assume this constant density at any given point in time across the observable realm so the the volume so you just need to know the volume of the observable realm which is just we think of it as a giant sphere of radius d universe and we and then we have to ask what is the density of of, of of the hydrogen and again the density of hydrogen we get from these observations of the what well, what we're really asking here is the density of, 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 of visible matter of baryonic matter okay which we're going to assume is all in hydrogen this is just a simplifying assumption that's not quite true but but it's enough for this calculation um so so we're going to assume that, that so what is the density of um of this stuff what is this this density of hydrogen well that's basically it's about 0 0.05 times what we call the critical density and the critical density is like a characteristic uh, sort of density in the universe which is 3 h naught squared over 8 pi g so this is just the 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 uh, if all the universe were were, were made of 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 um of hydrogen if all of it were hydrogen then it would have the critical density right but it's not it's only it's only five percent only five percent of the universe is made up of visible matter okay it's a really so, weird thing but only five percent of the universe is visible matter sorry what um i'm guessing this critical density is defined by a certain property if the if the universe had this critical density then then something if the, so the critical density the critical density is that number it's that number it's it's three times the current whole rate squared divided by eight pi g that's just what that's the definition of it the reason we call it critical is because it's it's the density that you would have if the universe was completely flat today so it's related to that curvature you like to you like to come back but 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 it's taken as a definition of just it's just a, a number which can be derived from the current Hubble parameter it has the density and, and so you can think of it as the total density of the universe today in a flat universe. That's what it is. Uh, and so 5% of that total energy density is made up of visible matter. That's the, that's, the ob that's the observational statement that we know. So we have this total density of the universe, which is the total density of the universe today, energy density of the universe today, 5% of which is, is, is made up of visible matter. So row critical is the, is the total. 5% is, is, is the baryonic stuff, the hydrogen and, and other atoms. What there is, is, is there's loads of stuff we can't see. There's dark matter, there's dark energy, and not counting those. Anyway, so now you've got all your ingredients to calculate what the mass of the universe is. And you can put it, just shove it all in. You can calculate it. And what you find is when you plug in all your numbers, then you find that this, this mass is about 1.6 times 10 to the 53 kilograms. And then you relate, you want the number, and then you ask for the number of atoms, and you just take the ratio. It's really nothing more complicated than that. It's the mass of the universe divided by the mass of hydrogen, and that's about um, 10 to the 80. Big okay. Bang. Okay. And just, really just cool. yeah, okay. That, first of all, that's, that's quite amazing. I, I never knew that. Um, and, uh, but, but to go back to this, this, this question I had earlier, I mean, so the, the the mental model I have in my mind, and maybe that's wrong, is okay. So so you have this ball of radius uh, d universe, and what you did was compute its mass and, and and density in terms of hydrogen. But it sounds like you're assuming on the complement of that ball, there's there's no mass, or 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 you're, I say, or well, maybe you're only. Think... Sorry. Yeah, when we say there's 10 to the 80 particles in the universe, we're saying there's 10 to the 80 particles. 
in our observable universe. Got it. Okay. It's defined as that region, which which is defined by the distance light could have traveled since the beginning. Got it. Okay. okay. So we really, so, okay. I, I thought it was a statement that, oh, that's 10 to the 80 particles in the universe full stop, but it's the observable universe. Do we have any understanding of the number of particles in the universe full stop? We don't even have, we don't even know. We have no understanding at all of, so this little picture that you've drawn here, Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so this let's just draw let's draw you at the middle of it there you are there you are right, Tim. Yep, You're right. right. okay so what's what's over here exactly what's out here and out here and out here well literally there could be anything like there literally could be anything there could be i'm going to try and draw a dragon now right there, there Fair could enough, be you literally have no idea what what is over here right here right you're right fair enough because it's not observable right right yeah for example we've never even been in any causal contact with it so we we just have no idea. It could be it could be that the density of the universe is far greater there. It may not even be made up of hydrogen. The, you, you know what? The, there could be bubbles. I mean, this I'm going to go off on one now, but there could be bubbles uh, in, 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 in of other universe. You know, in these distant realms, where the properties of nature are completely different. You know, maybe atoms can't even exist there. Maybe the cosmological constant is different. Maybe the dimensionality of the universe is different over there. This is all possible. Right, see. but where are we? we can only really deal with this little neighborhood that we have okay. to live in here and ask how many particles or how many atoms there are in that neighborhood instead of the 18. Roughly. I see. Okay, so, so, okay, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sometimes things are phrases there are this many things in the universe and they just forget to say that observable universe kind of implicitly, right? Correct, but we okay. cannot possibly say what happens beyond. We just, Got it. We just don't know. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, great. Um, are there any other uh, extreme numbers we should discuss, or maybe we, maybe we can start going into some more uh, some more of the things that we outlined? Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, you know, the, the, there's one of the things we know is that there's probably about ten to the nine a billion more photons than there are atoms. So there's more atoms, about ten to the eighty nine photons, for example. Um, so that's a, that's a big, slightly bigger number. That's again something you can measure. You can measure the the ratio of photons to 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 atoms essentially. Um, that's something you can measure again with cosmological observations. It's about that's about ten to the nine. So there's there's way more. So actually, photons are far more abundant than atoms. Um, but yeah, so these this this is probably kind of as big as it gets as far as our our observable realm is concerned. Right? It's, like, it's hard to get bigger in some respects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is. Uh, but we can think bigger, of course, and we can think sure. about, about, you know, sort of times, for example, like distant times in the future, which is something we could talk about. I don't know if you wanted to, to talk about that. So you can talk about, say, you know, how long is the sun going to exist for? You know, what's what, what's the what's the far future of our universe? So, for example, one of the things you can ask is so one of the things you can you can this is a kind of, you know, you can think about the really far future of our universe. Right. So the sun, you know, it dies after it's run out of fuel and blah, blah, blah. All this happens and then, the, you know, it goes supernova. And then but what what will happen then is, is that all the matter in the universe will start to collapse into black holes. And then you get this period of black hole domination. And you can ask, how long does this period of black hole domination go on for? This is really talking about really distant times in the universe. And, well, that period of black hole, black hole domination goes on for as long as it takes for those black holes to survive. So those black holes will eventually, you know, they, they swallow up all the matter around them. They've swallowed up everything, everything that we see, you, I, the sun, you know, Venus, everything has been swallowed up by black holes. And then those black holes sit there and there's this, really grim phase of the universe which lasts a very long time which is just dominated by these black holes patrolling around swallowing everything but those black holes will eventually decay over time and you can ask the question how long how long does this era of black hole domination last till and it lasts till about a google years so after a google years 10 to the 100 years black holes will you know until that point black holes will be the dominant ingredient and then eventually even the black holes die away and all you have is this bath of Hawking radiation, which fills the universe. Now, where does that number of a Google years come from? Well, it comes from calculating the evaporation time for the largest black holes that we see. So you, you can ask, what is, you know, you can ask, take, take the largest black hole that, that we have, which I'll just put it up, uh, which has, I think, a, a mass of about 10 to the 14 solar masses. And you can ask, what is, what is the lifetime of such a black hole? How long will it survive for? 
and it's about it's just over it's about 10 to the 106 i think the number is uh, years um but you could go bigger than that you could take what if all the mass of our universe was collapsed into a black hole how how long would that how long would it take that black hole to evaporate so if you took a if you took the you know all the matter in our in our observable universe you plumped it all into a black hole and you allowed that that black hole uh, to evaporate, then that would last, I think I've got 10 to the 136 years. So quite more than a Google years. Uh, but of course, you can go to even longer timescales than that. You can go to timescales way beyond that, which in which the universe will, will have this Poincaré recurrence, which is one of the concepts I talk about in my book, which is where the universe literally resets itself. And that's an even more distant timescale into the future. Wow. So there's some um, crazy without without getting too much on a tangent, uh, wouldn't um how do I say I, I feel like this this depends obviously on on the uh, asymptotic properties of the models we have of the universe. Um if the universe is expanding and even possibly even accelerating, then it, is there any possibility of Poincaré recurrence or are we just going to have this cosmic heat death and that's that's that? <laughs> No, no, no. So, so it's exactly actually it's a very good point. So, so actually those scenarios where the universe just sort of so so we can imagine. So this is an interesting question. What is the what is the long term future of the universe? So that depends a lot on the on what is dark energy, which we don't really know what dark energy is. But how and how is dark energy going to dilute with time or not dilute with time? So one thing the dark energy might do, it might have some property which way it causes it causes the universe to eventually crunch. And so the universe is just going to turn back on itself. The expansion will turn around and the universe will crunch. That could happen, depending on the properties of dark energy. But more likely, what the most likely thing that dark energy, you know, in terms of the stuff that fits the data really well and so on and so forth, that the thing that dark energy is most likely to be is the energy of empty space, which I'm sure we'll talk about, this cosmological constant. If that is what dark energy is, um, then, then there is going to be this very the, the universe will will go through this this black hole uh, phase where black holes are swallowing everything and then they evaporate and then you just have this this heat death of the universe and then where literally you just all the all this you just got this radiation about and the universe is dominated by dark energy just just everything else is completely diluted the universe is expanding at a, at an accelerated rate but a very gentle accelerated rate. And the universe gets bigger and bigger and bigger and dominated by this dark energy. Now, the thing is, it's actually in those scenarios that we do expect that you'll get the point career recurrence. Because one of the weird things about it is even though the universe, you know, expands and expands and expands, the um, <clears throat> because of the nature of the accelerated ex uh, expansion, we have a horizon that surrounds us. And actually, there is there is only a finite number of states that the observable universe can exist in in this scenario. It's actually finite. It, it, it corresponds to the fact that actually that that universe has a finite entropy. So there's a finite number of states that such a universe can exist in. And it's when you have a finite system like that that Poincaré recurrences will occur, because eventually you will end up back where you started. The system will just explore all the possibilities and end up back where you started. So, so it's precisely the situation where you have uh, dark energy as sort of this lingering cosmological constant that just evolves forever that you expect to get the resets. Wow. If it was okay. something more exotic than the thought, sure. I see. Um, that sounds like a very interesting topic, although I think if we go down that rabbit hole, it might, it might uh, take us too far afield. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that's something for me to, to think about. Um, but since uh, the next thing we wanted to get to was this thing about the doppelganger, um, it sounds like we're already there because you started talking about uh, entropy and black hole. So maybe maybe why don't we just dive right into that? And and um, well, yeah, why, why don't we start by by uh, you giving us your thoughts on this doppelganger problem? It's a very it's a very uh, fun problem to think about, and I don't know if that's uh, is that something that you or or maybe actual physicists think about, or is this just kind of a cute cute puzzle to kind of maybe illustrate some of these these points and extreme numbers yeah more, more the latter really i don't think people are really worried about <laughs> doppelganger. I mean, the distance is so uh, so great that you don't need to worry too much uh, but so so is this an example of, of where for me of where, where you know i took a video and i was thinking about big numbers in this case of google plex and I was I was trying to think about ways in which I can I can bring those big numbers into into sort of some kind of physical concept and and, and it led me to this idea of 
well, what would what what would the world be like if it was what would the universe be like if it was a Google Plex meters across? Now we don't know how big the universe really is. We've already talked about the size of the observable universe. We've said that the universe could be much bigger than that. We don't know. Uh, we don't know what's beyond really. We can speculate that at least the laws of physics maybe are the same in principle. I mean, there's an assumption there. But but if, if they are, and then you can imagine a very large universe which goes way beyond the observable realm, stretching a Google Plex meters across, perhaps even more, perhaps even infinitely far, who knows, right? And if the laws of physics are maintained over those vast regions, again, an assumption, but if they are, then we can start to speculate about distances to doppelgangers. And that, so, so very simply, you know, and, and so 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 very very loosely, where does the idea come from? So you can take take you Tim, and you can ask how many different ways are there to describe, you know, you know something. You know, let's just take the the, the region of space that you occupy, right? The region we can go into more detail, but very loosely, the region of space you occupy is roughly a cubic meter of space. How many different ways are there to sort of describe a cubic meter of space? Is it infinite or not? And actually, we don't think it's infinite. Thanks to quantum mechanics and thanks to gravity, we think the answer is actually finite. And so if there's only a finite number of ways to arrange a cubic meter of space, then in an infinite universe, it's inevitable that I'm going to get copies. Right? I'm going to get copies of different you know, cubic volumes of space. There'll be a cubic volume of space which looks like, like empty space. Another cubic volume of space looks like empty space. Okay, those are doppelgangers of each other, but not very interesting ones. But there's also more complex doppelgangers. There's complex doppelgangers, which is this, there's this, there's this uh, uh, cubic volume of, you know, cubic meter of space, which is you. And all the atoms and the state of that, of that cubic meter of space is one particular state. And then in a large enough universe, that will be repeated. It will be repeated somewhere very far away, but it, it will be repeated just because the only the number of possibilities is only finite. And so eventually you start getting repetitions. And so it really boils down to the question, why, why is the number of possibilities uh, finite? I guess that's, that's, that's the key question. Sure. Should, should we maybe look at that computation? It, I, it has to do with um, black hole entropy, uh, I guess, because basically... Um, if you put enough mass into a, a small enough volume, you're going to get a black hole, and then black holes have a notion of entropy, and then this is where these these computations come up. Correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, so, so there's kind of a, a crude way we can we can already start to ask this question. So so, and it, and, and this will give us not quite the right answer, but maybe it's a it's a building block to, to sort of the, the idea. So so I, I want to look at a volume of space, which is like uh, just a volume here, uh, which is a cubic meter. So v is is roughly uh, one cubic meter. OK, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this 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 cubic meter into into building blocks. OK, so I'm just going to break it up into loads of little building blocks. OK, loads of tiny, tiny building blocks. Right, so they're broken up into lots of little Lego bits, if you like. Well, how small, small are my are my little Lego bricks? Well, let's say I'm going to make them as small as they can possibly be without breaking space time. So the smallest distance that you can talk about in space time is the Planck length. OK, so that's the smallest distance in space time. That's about 10 to the minus 35 meters. This is the so-called Planck length. If you go any smaller than that, our understanding of space time break, completely breaks down. It's the scale at which uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity uh, becomes overwhelmed by quantum corrections. You really, you really cannot. You want to go to shorter distances. You you, you simply cannot talk about. You, you don't know how to do it at, at shorter distances. You, don't, you can't even talk about space time in a meaningful way. Then, so this is kind of in some sense the smallest distance in nature. So you know the, the most extreme thing we could do is break um, our, our cubic volume, a cubic meter of space, into these Planckian sized Lego bricks. Maybe maybe that's overkill, but it's it, it's it's pretty good. But that's a pretty extreme thing to do. So you can ask how many of these Planckian br size bricks have you got? Okay, well, how many have you got? Well, you've got, well, it's just V divided by, they've each got a volume of about L Planck cubed. So that's gonna correspond to about 10 to the 105 bricks. So that's the total number of bricks that this makes, that, that's making this thing up. Okay, so let's suppose, let's suppose that each brick 
can be in, let's say, well, K different, or let's say two different states. So it can be a black brick or a white brick. Maybe that's a bit of an oversimplification, but let's just say it's either black or white. But the important thing is that it's finite. It's a finite number of different states each brick can, can exist in. Um, we'll say it's, we'll say it's two just just to keep the calculation simple. Okay, so we can ask how many different ways can you make how many different states can this overall cubic volume now be in? Each brick is either black or white, and there are ten to the one hundred and five of them. Okay, so that means the total number of states of microstates will come of states of v so in other words the total number of possible states this volume could have is two to the 10 to the 105 okay now where does that come from so each state is either black each brick is either black or white so the first brick is black or white that's two possibilities the next brick is black or white that's another two possibilities so two times two the next one's black or white so that's two times two times two the next one's black or white, two times two times two times two. And again, I do this 10 to the 105 times. So I get two to the 10 to the 105. Okay, so this is the number total. This is a crude estimate for the total number of states that a cubic volume can be in. Now, it's finite. Even this is finite. Okay, but this is an overestimate. Now we're getting into Googleplex number territory, just, just from looking at this number, which is, is which is incredible. Maybe just one clarifying question. Should I think of this uh, discrete number of states for, for each of these bricks as something like the um, finite number of states for, say, like the spin of an electron or some other kind of quantum number? Is this? Yeah, you can think uh, of that. I think that would be nice okay. okay. I see. Yeah, that's okay. a nice okay. one. Okay. Okay. But it, ultimately, what we're saying is, is that each each Planckian each Planckian brick has a finite number of degrees of freedom. If it's got k degrees of freedom, k, you know, with k possible states, then this will be k to the ten to the one. Okay. Be right. Because, black or white. Yeah, because I'm trying to think. I mean, just just to make this more watertight. I mean, other degrees of freedom are are things like position or momentum, and those aren't discrete, right? So how how do you kind of discretize? that situation sure but h bar is finite and 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 i i do have i do have um i do have the a finite size and phase space due to h bar so these these measurements do okay so this is maybe where this this description becomes a little crude you know but let's now go to the and actually this is an overestimate anyway oh okay so let's okay. now do so let's now do a little bit i just wanted to give some intuition for maybe how you think about these things but now let's be maybe let's now be a bit more precise and, and we can allay your fears about about such things okay okay, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is an overest okay. okay what we're really asking is given this cubic meter of space we're asking what is the total number of states that could describe it okay that's the that's what we want to know the answer to okay and now this is where black holes come in OK, so black holes are these amazing objects. So this is where entropy. So what is entropy? Entropy is is it, entropy counts the number of states. So, for example, let's take an egg. Right. Now, I look at an egg and it's an egg. Right. It's got a particular mass. It's got a particular temperature, it's got a particular size. Right. But it also has all this. And, and those are my macroscopic things I can measure about the egg. But there's also the hidden detail there. The hidden information, which is about the rearrangement of all the atoms inside the egg, and you know, they're spinning this way or that way. What are all the degrees of freedom of this egg? They're all hidden inside. It's information I don't need. I'm not interested in it. It's kind of missing information. Okay. There are lots of different possibilities. Lots of each each possible precise arrangement can be a possible microstate, what we'll call a microstate for the egg. So one arrangement of the atoms with spins pointing this way and that corresponds to one microstate for the egg. Another one corresponds to another one. Another one corresponds to another one. But as far as we're concerned, we can't tell them apart because that's microscopic details that we're not interested in. We're only looking at this egg, right? We don't care if the atom's this way or that. We'll see, those are different microstates, but as far as we're concerned, it will look like the same egg, right? So. What is entropy? Entropy counts all those, all that missing information. It counts all those possible microstates. In fact, it's the log, it's the logarithm of that. So entropy is the log 
of the of the number of microstates in the system. So n is the number of microstates. Number of microstates. Like that properly. Yeah. Okay. So that that's where entropy is. Okay. So it counts all those different possibilities, the hidden information. Okay. Now now it comes to the point. Now what is the thing that hides you information best in the universe? Well, nothing hides information better than a black hole. It's the best hider of information there is, right? It's just great at it. And then, you know, <clears throat> I like to do this sort of discussion. Like, what if, what if you saw an elephant? So, so there's this thing about black holes that they have no hair, like a bit like me. I don't have much hair, but they have even less hair than me, right? And and, and so so black holes, they, they 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 don't carry hair. So what is that? What's that statement? It means that when we look at a black hole, the only things that we can measure when we look at a black hole are its mass its charge and its spin, the only things. So if you see a black hole appear at the bottom of your garden, you can ask the following question. You can say, okay, well, I can measure its mass, I can measure its spin, and I can measure its uh, electric charge. Okay, cool, I do that. And then the next day, I then I see the black hole again. And I measure those quantities again. And let's say that the, the, the mass has gone up by the mass of an elephant. Okay, what do you infer? Has it swallowed an elephant? It might have done, but it might have swallowed a car that has the same mass as an elephant. Or it might have swallowed, I don't know, you know, a, a stack of encyclopedias that has the same mass in, as an elephant. We don't know. And there is no way of knowing by looking at that black hole because it has no hair. It doesn't give that information away. It hides that information. And so you can sort of see intuitively that black holes really, really very much are this great hider of information. And because of that, they have the, the great stories of entropy. Because okay, there's lots of, because you can think of that black hole and there is one microstate, which is where it was built by an elephant and one where it was built by a car and one where it was built by an encyclopedias. And all of them are contributing to the entropy. Okay, because it's hiding this information. So black holes are the, are, are the greatest stories of, of entropy there are in the universe. So if you want to ask, if you want to look at a region of space. Sorry, yeah, can, can I, uh, uh, it almost sounded like there's, uh, how do I say, um, we talk about entropy as the number of microstates that are consistent with the macro state, but it, um, okay, th there's two extreme limits to, to unpack what you just said. Either the black hole should have as every possible microstate, all the things that it could have consumed that had the mass of the elephant, or since it has no hair, it doesn't have any internal states and so has you no know, or, or, or little entropy. So I'm, uh, I'm a little uh, confused about how to interpret the, the, this black, uh, this no, no hair result in terms of microstates. So, so one thing we can't, we don't know is we don't really, I mean, there are, there are some sort of quite obscure examples within string theory where, where you can relate the number of microstates to the black hole entropy directly, right? But in general, we don't know how to do that. We be, simply because we, we don't know what the microstates of black hole really are. So what I'm trying to get is an in, in, intuitive picture that they, the black holes seem to have this ability to, to hide information, which may indicate that they have entropy. Okay. There is a specific example in string theory where you can identify uh, in a very sort of you know contrived setting, you can identify what the microstates are and then relate that to the entropy of the corresponding black object. Uh, but generally, we don't know how to do this. Okay, we don't know. It's a, it's a mystery. What are the true black microstates of black hole? Now, <clears throat> what we do know, however, so so then we say, okay, so do black holes carry entropy? Okay, so there are. You can ask questions like, and this is what people like Bekenstein did way back when in nineteen seventies, and start thinking about what happens if something falls into a black hole. If that if if the entropy, black hole carries no entropy. And something falls, so you've got so you've got some state of matter outside a black hole. It has entropy. So you've got an egg. Let's take an egg, right? Let's take an egg. It carries entropy, right? Now, let's suppose you want to say black holes don't have entropy. Now, chuck that egg into a black hole. It looks like the entropy of the universe has gone down because you've lost the entropy of the egg. Well, that violates the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy should never decrease. So this immediately starts ringing alarm bells. Well, if I start saying the black holes don't have entropy, I've got a problem with the second law of thermodynamics because I throw the egg into a black hole and suddenly the entropy is gone. 
So this was this is what Beckerstein started to think about race. Well, actually, I think I can get around this by saying that the black holes actually have entropy. Okay, so now you start to think about how much entropy they do have. So how do you figure that out? So what what people like Christ, Christy Alu, I can't say his name, Christy Aludu, I, I never get, I can never say his name properly, and Hawking um, were doing back again in the early 70s. They started to look at objects. They started to look at the processes involving black holes. And were there any quantities which never decreased? So you take classical processes involving black holes, I don't know, for example, you could merge two black holes together, take two black holes, turn them into one black hole. You know, uh, when you do things like this, are there any quantities which never decrease? Now, for example, there are processes which can decrease the mass of a black hole. And there are processes which can decrease the spin of a black hole. So mass and spin, they're not quantities which can't decrease. They can. There are processes where you can you can do this. But it turns out there's always one object which never decreases in any black hole process. And that's the area of its event horizon. The area of its event horizon never, there's no process which you can come up with, classical process involving black holes, I don't know. There's all these great tricks you can do, merge black holes together, you can try to mine black holes, do all sorts of crazy fun stuff. All these legitimate things you can try to do to a black hole, but whatever you do, you will never decrease the area of the event horizon. So this made Beckenstein go, wow. So you've got this thing, this quantity which never decreases, I know, I, I know that I want black holes to have entropy. I know entropy is supposed to never decrease. So maybe that thing that never decreases is the entropy. So he said that the area of the event horizon should be the entropy. Okay, And actually then, then, then along came Hawking and actually found the exact formula for the black hole entropy based on, he based, basically started doing quantum mechanics around the event horizon of a black hole. And he actually, found the, the precise formula relating the entropy of a black hole to its, the area of its event horizon. And that formula is as follows. It's that the black area of a black hole, sorry, the entropy of a black hole is the area of its event horizon divided by four times the Planck length squared. Okay, so this is this Planck length, which is this, this tiny distance scale here. So again, so Beckenstein realized that this came from, from um, realized that area never decreases. Well, others had said area never decreases. Therefore, he said, well, maybe the area is the entropy. But the actual proportionality factor, which is the one, this 4L Planck squared, Hawking was the one that came up with that. And, and so, so there's a few things here, actually, so that you can see. So clearly the answer is non-zero. The other thing to realize is actually it's not infinite either. And that, that, that might seem... Well, why should it be infinite? But actually, look, this is this is what where gravity is really crucial here. Because if you don't have gravity in a world with no gravity, the Planck length actually shrinks to zero size. In fact, in a world without quantum mechanics, the Planck length shrinks to zero size. And so you can see if the Planck length shrinks to zero size, this entropy will actually go infinite. So the finite entropy of black holes is related to two things, quantum mechanics and gravity, okay? Because without either of those, this Planck goes to zero. But because it's not zero, and because we have quantum mechanics and because we have gravity, that black hole entropy is, is actually finite. And that's really important for our doppelganger calculation, okay? So black holes carry entropy, okay? And one of the things you can do these funky tricks, so now we, we accept that black holes carry entropy. Now you can ask the question, now let's consider you or anybody else, and let's consider a. Let's do this. This, this is a cool experiment which um, which which Suskin did. So we can we can get this bound on what is the maximum entropy by thinking about these black holes. What is the maximum entropy you can have in any given air volume of space? So we 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 know that black holes carry entropy, but I want to ask a slightly different question. I want to ask what is the most entropy we can we can fit into any any region of space. What's the maximum entropy you can have in any region of space? Is there a maximum? So I take a volume, let's say a cubic meter, is there a maximum entropy that, 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 that anything living in that cubic meter can have? Is it, is, is it maximized? And it is, and let's see why. This is, this is, this is due to Leonard Susskind. It's a really nice, nice sort of uh, thought experiment. So 
what I want to imagine is a situation where I've got uh, some some matter, which I'm going to illustrate by a little man there. OK, so this is some matter which has mass M. So I've got this little guy which is representing matter and it's got mass M. OK, and I'm going to surround him by some, you know, a shell of matter, which is going to have mass big M. And that radius of that shell I'm going to call R. OK, so the total mass of this system is little m plus big M. So this little m is the mass of the matter. Big M is the, is the mass of the shell. OK, now I'm going to say, what is the initial entropy of the, um, of the matter? OK, so in the initial entropy, I'm going to say is the entropy of the matter, so S matter. OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink this. Uh, so let me call this M total, by the way. The total mass. I'm going to shrink this, this, uh, this shell down. OK, so I'm going to shrink R down to a sort of critical size. which I'm going to call our crit, which is 2G times M total. So I'm going to shrink this, this, this down, OK? Now, if I shrink this, this, this shell down to this size, then that distance I've, I've written there, that R critical, is actually the swatched R radius of, mm. of this, matter, this, this, combined, um, this combined masses. So that's what that so what that means is is that that object is now a black hole. So I've taken this this, this distribution of matter, I've got a shell around it. I shrink this I shrink the shell down so that everything is now contained inside. So it's the only object that can now be is a black hole because I've shrunk it all down. Okay. I know what the what the uh, black hole entropy is. By the way, I know what the entropy of that black hole is. Okay. So that means that the final entropy okay so s final well what is it well i've now shrunk everything down so that now the only thing i have is a black hole so the entropy of that final state is the entropy of the black hole okay second law now we'd use the second law of thermodynamics second law of thermodynamics says that entropy should never increase Okay, or, or sorry, should never decrease. <laughs> yeah, yeah, should never decrease. It. Yeah, sorry, I'm, that's opposite. <laughs> so this is what it's after you do this. Yeah, so, so the um, so the initial entropy should always be less than or equal to the final entropy. Sorry, should always be less than or equal to the final entropy. Okay, but this is the entropy of matter, of the matter, and this is the entropy of the black hole. Okay, so so this is what so let's just recap. We've got this shell. We shrink that we we have some initial uh, matter distribution. We have some initial entropy. Okay, we shrink the shell down. Okay, the shell now everything the mass the combined mass is now is now in such a small region that the only object it can be is a black hole. Okay, you now know the entropy of that thing. That's the black hole entropy. And because matter can the, the, the entropy cannot increase, so I, can't, so I keep saying it again, cannot decrease, that means the initial entropy needed to be less than the final entropy, which means the entropy of the matter had to be the entropy of the black of the corresponding black hole, had to be less than the entropy of the corresponding black hole. So what this tells you is, is that any region of space, so a cubic meter of space, for example, any cubic meter of space. The entropy contained within must be less than or equal to the entropy of the black hole that would just fill that space. It's or bounded the, from above by that value. Yeah, or the ent sorry, or the entropy of the black hole that you would get from uh, compressing the matter in that volume down to a black hole, right? Maybe that's the same thing you you said. Uh so so no 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 it's it's a strong it's a slightly different statement to that so 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 you take that matter mm -hmm. whatever matter you have in there mm -hmm. you're looking at a volume of space cube meter the entropy of that matter 
should be no larger than the entropy of a black hole the size of that volume. So that would have more mass in principle than, than you had initially. Um, okay, but the entropy cannot be greater. I'm trying to think. Okay. Um maybe maybe there's some other okay let, let me just write out the logic here so there's there's sort of two cases either so there's case 1 which is what i just described which is you have this uh volume of mass and then you shrink it and then you then you say and now this is a black hole and then you can bound the entropy here with the entropy of the black hole but you're saying something different which is this case 2 which is you have this larger guy outside that encapsulates that and then you look at the the entropy you would get if you compressed the larger sphere down to a black hole of size the original sphere i think that's what you're saying correct yeah but then, yeah yeah but you can you can think of this guy initially here and just think of this our crit radius right mm -hmm. and whatever the entropy in there is it's got to mm -hmm. be less than the entropy of the corresponding black hole i see I see. That you get when you move that guy down. Okay. <laughs> and so, so so that's the upper bound. There is some ways that this is a little loose. There are some technicalities that you can get around that you can be a little bit more careful, but roughly speaking, this is this is this is a, a good estimate for the for the maximum amount of entropy you can have in any region of space. You take the black hole that would just fit inside that space. And that's the most entropic object. Another another way of saying it is that, well, let's suppose the other way of saying it is the following. Take you in, in, in your volume of space. Okay, and I'm gonna start throwing eggs at you. Okay, <laughs> throw eggs at you. And and not and those eggs are sticking to you, right? And so you, you're accreting all these eggs, and, and you're not but the volume isn't particularly growing up, but the but the mass is. Okay, eventually. I throw enough eggs at you that I've thrown, I've added so much mass to you without changing the volume, let's say, that now you have to be a black hole. <laughs> and the entropy had to go up in that process, right? The entropy had, so the entropy had to begin with, had to be less than the entropy you had at the end. Okay. So the entropy had to begin with, had to be less than the black hole, the corresponding black hole entropy. But you've added mass to kind of realize it in some sense in that, in that scenario, mm -hmm. right? But but if it's a general principle, it tells you that the that the entropy in any given region is always less than the, the black hole that just fills the, the region. Mm -hmm. Now, if okay. you I see. So okay, so <laughs> just to just to uh, wrap up this analogy that you had with throwing is if you kept throwing okay, so you throw there's this final egg that you throw at me that's gonna convert me into a black hole. Now you throw another egg at me. What's what what's going to happen? Why can't this so upper I'm, bound? Okay. What, why can't this upper bound keep growing indefinitely? So okay, so that final egg that I throw at you, that deserve, you've already turned to a black hole. I throw another egg. What's going to yeah. happen now? Now the black hole has not able to grow. Ah. And now it it's no longer inside that volume. It's, Got it. it's now gone beyond that volume. Ah. Okay. 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 Got it. Okay. Okay. So in some sense, there's a. Okay. Yeah, there's like a maximum entropy density in in, in, in a sense. Yeah, because okay, the entropy per volume. Like that, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, great. Um, okay, maybe, maybe, so it sounds like, yeah, we're basically kind of half, I guess halfway with this doppelganger problem because now we have a maximal entropy and, and, and now we just need to know kind of how, how much space how much room we have in the universe or how many universes there are, right? Or how many, how many possible sample sizes of, of a box we, we, we have. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 so now, now what we can say is we can do our, we can do our better estimates of the, of the number of states in this, in this cubic volume that you could possibly have. What's the mm -hmm. maximum number of states. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's do that. Let's do it. Carol. So we've now got this cubic volume. Okay. We don't need to do our Lego bricks anymore, which is, this is unnecessary. We just, it's got roughly one meter cube. So that's roughly the size. We're, we're, we're modeling humans as spherical here, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but you know, we, we can do things like that. That's fine. No, that the maximum number of states that, that this that can describe that you have here. So the number of microstates, the total number, it cannot exceed. It simply cannot exceed this number. So it's E to the entropy of the black hole. Corresponding black hole, which has the same surface, which just fits inside. Yeah. 
Maybe just yeah. maybe just one it comment on this. Because, yeah, because we uh, in this in this Beckenstein work and, and, and follow up work um, area. This formula for black hole entropy obeyed the formal properties of thermodynamic entropy. Thermodynamic entropy uh, is understood in terms of microstates. Um, it, is it the case that it, therefore in these works they also showed that the entro- uh, the black hole entropy also has a correspondence with microstates? Because we, we've only discussed kind of a formal analogy in terms of non you know monotone quantities, but you can also relate black hole entropy to microstates. That's that's another kind of step that's being so, so this is what I said earlier. So, so this, this is what, what's not known. Um, so, so there is an example of particular states in particular uh, black objects in string theory, which very special black objects where the microstates are known and one can count those microstates and relate them to the corresponding entropy of the black object. In general, however, so if you just take, like, I don't know, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, and you ask me what are the microstates of that black hole, nobody has any idea. Hmm. We okay. we don't know. We so no, okay. we don't we don't have that same microscope that the same identification of what are the microstates. No, we don't have that. I see. That's okay. a really fundamental question. We really okay. have to actually identify the microstates or black hole in a general setting and 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 then say, yeah, a look, we count them, bang, there's the entropy. Yeah, no, but that calculation is not known. You're absolutely right. What Hawking did was Hawking then there, there was a known analogy between the thermodynamics of a black of, of, of between thermodynamics and thermodynamic relations and how black hole masses change, for example, and how and how this could be related to to certain quantities, which Hawking was able to identify with the temperature and things that he was able to identify with the entropy. And then that's how he, he did some gymnastics involving those those things. But no, no, no he has not. He did not go away and identify the microstates of the black hole. We did not do that. I see. Okay. So we're we're going to operate under the assumption that we can, or maybe with this specialized black hole that you you talked about, for the purpose. We'll assume of this. that the microstates. Yeah, assume okay. that the microstates exist. But what entropy is? Okay. So okay. If they exist, and assume they exist, and there's no weirdness here, then the total number of microstates that you could have, if if it were a black hole, it would have this number of microstates, and certainly that's the maximum because the entropy is maximized by the black hole. Okay, so the total maximum of states you could have is, is 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 this number. Okay, so what is this number? Okay, so that number, well, so the the area of the black the black hole is given by Hawking's formula, which is the area of the event horizon divided by four L Planck squared. Well, what's the area of the event horizon? Well, roughly speaking, it's about a square meter, roughly. I mean, you know, we could be more precise about that if we want to, but you know. If the volume is a cubic meter, the, the, the area is roughly a square meter. I, I'm not going to worry about order one factors here. Okay, I'm going to be lazy. <laughs> uh, and then L Planck is, this is probably where the mathematician in you gets upset. Uh, <laughs> and L Planck is 10 to the divide is 35 meters. So roughly speaking, this is about 10 to the 17. Okay, so this is this is this is the number. Okay, so now, so now we can we can. Uh, I mean, okay, we, maybe maybe I should be a, a little bit. Um, I think I think that's okay. I mean, maybe the factor of should I, should I be better than that? Should I, should I should I be better? I've actually been better behaved than that in my notes, but ah, no, nah, I'm not. I'm going to be. I'm going to leave it like that. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. so, 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 so 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 this takes this takes. Uh, so now you can calculate n. And so n is going to be e to the 10 to the to the 17. Okay. Now what's interesting is is the number we had before, you said we were already getting into Googleplex numbers. This number is less than a Googleplex. This is actually less than a Google. So a Googleplex, if you remember, is 10 to the 10 to the 100. Okay, this is not as big as that. This is smaller. Quite a lot smaller, actually. So so I think if you work it out. Um, this is this is I think if I remember right here, ten to the ten to the sixty nine. So I, I see. Rough, Although rough, I, rough. it's it's Googleplex territory ish because it, it you, you have a, a tower of exponential. It's not just a, a ten to a a reasonably large number. It's ten to the ten to that number. So it, it's sort of Googleplex ish. Yes, but crucially, crucially. So 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 this is what's crucial, right? So so it is. A, yeah, it's like a tower like that in the same way that a Googleplex is, but it's still way less than a Googleplex. Sure, sure. This, sure. This, 
this 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 is true right this is <laughs> yes, yes. The Google yeah, yeah 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 whereas i the, agree whereas the estimate we had before was what did we have we had i think we had two to the 10 to the 105 that's actually great in the google play sure 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 but th this, yeah, this yeah. number is actually a lot less I mean, a Google Plus is just an arbitrary number, so I don't really care about its particular value. I just meant that it's ten to a ten to a something rather than a ten to a something. Right, but remember what our thought experiment is. Our thought experiment is in a universe that's a Google Plus meters across. Are there doppelgangers? Mm -hmm. Now you see, right? Well, how many possible states are there? How many possible ways are there to describe this cubic meter of space? But it's not the bot. It's not. It's not this number here. This is an overestimate. If it were uh, this number here, then we, I wouldn't expect doppelgangers. Yes, I, I see now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, right. But it's not. It's this number, which is way less than a Googleplex. Way less. Got it. Still massive, right? But way less, right? So, so for that reason, I think it's almost implausible to suggest that in what I call a Google Plisian universe, that your doppelganger could not exist. Although, to, right? just so to that, be. To be pedantic about this, I mean, basically what you're employing here is what's called the pigeonhole principle, right? So if you if you have a Googleplex number of boxes, but there are only n many configurations, then of course there has to be at least two boxes that uh, have the same configuration. In fact, many boxes because the dis of the large disparity. Um, however, that doesn't say that you will be the one that's duplicated. It, it could be many other uninteresting boxes that are duplicated. So if, if you want the doppelganger for you specifically, uh, there's no guarantee. There, there will be doppelganger pairs. Uh, whether it's you or not is the doppelganger is is that's to be determined. To be fair, right? right. Now, so so it's implausible. It's it's it, it's of course true that there are so, there are obviously re replicas, many replicas of, of things. Now, so then it asks the question: Is there a replica of you? Right. So that of course boils down to the question of what is the probability of you? <laughs> so, so given all the possibilities, what, what is the likelihood that one of them is you? Are you an either likely state or an unlikely state? Well, you're obviously an unlikely state. I think that's fair to say. You're a very unique guy, Tim, right? You know, <laughs> right? But actually, the, the, you can then go away and try to calculate, well, what is the what is the given this number of possibilities, you know, how small does the probability of you have to be to not get at least two of you? Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can calculate that. And, and the number comes out is about Google in a Google Plex. <laughs> so, so that's 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 so the 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 probability of you has to be less than the Google in a Google Plex, roughly. And so that is such a ridiculously small. So are you that unlikely? Are you less than a Google in a Google Plex? Sorry, that's a so, tiny so, number. Yeah. So a Google over a Google Plex. That's the ratio, that's the ratio we're talking about. Roughly, here. yeah. Huh? The Google doesn't really matter here. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's one of Google. <laughs> yeah. One of the Googleplex is kind of Google there. But but let's say a Google and a Googleplex, so one in a Googleplex possibility or a Google and a Googleplex possibility, whatever. It's a tiny, tiny number. That's how small the probability has to be. I see. For them not to be. I'm guessing, is that, a, is that, a, uh, did you do that? Because basically you have, I mean, okay. I mean, I guess you. I'm not sure how you got that number. I was going to say you could take one over n and then multiply. Yeah, I think it. Really yeah, you could multiply it by the number of irrelevant perturbations of you. You know, if I had one more piece of hair or I ate an apple today, uh, that, that that won't change who I am, right? So I'm assuming that's how you got the Google numerator, which is dwarfed by yeah, the so Google you just, you just say, you just, denominator. So in a world with basically ten to the you know Googleplex sites, uh, what's the you can ask what's the probability? What's the chance there are I versions of you? And so that, that number is P to the I, which I call it P to the I, and it's basically um, K choose I, uh, P probability of U, right, to the I, one minus the probability of U to the K minus I. That's the number. And now you can ask, you can ask the question. Um, you, you you know, so then you can ask, what is what's the chance of there being just one of you? Okay, well that's just going to be. I mean, I won't go into it, but but you know, so that's just k times pu, uh, one minus pu to the k minus one. And then you can ask, well, I need that. To, what? Let's ask. You know, is this bigger or less than a half, for example? What, how, how, you know, you can you can ask, what is the chance of this? Is is, is there is, is you know is there going to be a more than 50% chance there's only one of you. 
And for that number, you need PU to be really small, and you you can find it because this you can you just take some logs and you end up with a Google. Uh, I see. Okay. Okay. I I I I see this. So. Well, this is this is fun, and of course, maybe uh, just uh, so so people have some leftover thoughts with your book. Of course, your book goes over uh, astronomically much much larger numbers uh, than than this um, grabs number and, and things like that. Um, but I think this this is probably I don't know, like a I mean, can can you generate another tower so easily, or is this kind of like this this three a tower of three is pretty much where you're going to stop in in, in physics. You mean in terms of yeah 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 I mean, yeah because these other numbers have have, well, yeah. have very very large towers of exponents here we got to three which is already quite uh, you know uh, extreme I don't know if, is there can you get to a fourth tower I don't think so I don't think I, I mean I'm not aware of one off the top of my head I'm trying to think if the if the maybe the Poincaré recurrence does let me just remind myself mm. what bit of that it has a fourth but yeah that's a four tower that's a four tower guy so the Poincaré wow. recurrence time is a four tower guy. oh wow yeah, yeah, yeah. okay okay e to the it's e to the n and then uh and then n is 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 related to the entropy um so it's yeah so it's e to the so it's the number it says e to the number of microstates let's start another slide and let's get on to naturalness so with um maybe maybe you can describe in your own words the the, the setup I, we're going to talk about the cosmological constant which is actually the opposite extreme we've been talking about very very large numbers now we're going to talk about very very tiny uh, positive numbers. Uh, yeah, why, why, why don't you uh, take the lead? Yeah, so I think I think you said it. I think you said it really nicely at the start. Is um, you know you don't expect naturalist is is very loosely the statement that you don't expect large numbers, large ratios to appear in physics. Um, so, but perhaps more intuitively is I think let, let's let's perhaps just stay away from physics for a second. Let's just let's just take um, I don't know. Let, let's take a a, a company. So you've got a, a company that's dealing in, you know, million pound trades or million dollar trades. Um, and it, you know, it, it does a trade here, which is a million and something dollars. It does a trade here, which it loses, you know, uh, two million. And, you know, the, the, the comings and goings are, are, are dealt in millions. OK, now at the end of the month, you would, you, you, you know, and, and let's say, you know, you've got roughly not exactly, but roughly equal numbers of of uh, ingoings as outgoings, but the, the numbers are always in the millions. And at the end of the month, you look at the balance sheet. What would you expect to happen? Would you expect to see the balance sheet's going to be either you would expect to be plus millions or minus millions? This is this is your natural expectation, right? This, that word natural. What would be unnatural if it, is if it were exactly zero. Or if it was one pound or one dollar, right? Sorry, I'm going to keep saying pounds. <laughs> but it, if it was if it was one dollar, would that not be weird? You're dealing with millions here, and millions there. Everything's millions. There's all these millions going in and out, fluctuating, and da 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 da. And then you look at the balance sheet; it's 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 it's, it's all come out to one dollar. That's unexpected, surely. You would want to think there was a bit of a reason for that, right? That feels like some some conspiracy. That's naturalness, right? You've got all this, 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 you know, you're dealing with millions and suddenly the answer comes out as a pound. That's not, that's not normal. That doesn't really make sense. There has to be a reason for it. And so that, that that's kind of, here, here's another example. Okay, so before we, before we understood that the, um, you know, the planets all re revolve around the, the sun, you know, people used to talk, think about the earth was the center of the universe and, 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 and that and they had the geocentric model of the universe. Okay, so what was the situation then? This is this was an unnatural. If, if those guys had known about naturalness, they would have realized that this didn't make any sense. Okay, so you measure the velocities of the other planets. Okay, and they're roughly like Venus and Mars and so on. Now they're all roughly going at tens of thousands of miles per hour, hundreds of thousands of miles per hour, right? Okay, and you're saying the Earth is still. That's unnatural. That's not natural. Okay, so that doesn't seem to make sense. That that you need an explanation for why the Earth is still. Well, of course, the Earth is not still. What we have is the Earth. When you start, to, when you move to the the heliocentric model with the with the Sun at the center, then you realize that the Earth is also moving with roughly you know hundred tens to hundred thousands of miles per hour. Okay, so it's no it's no different to the other guys. It's just the kind of the same. And then you do have an explanation for why you think of the sun as being still in something. It's not really, it's moving around the galaxy, but in, in that picture, 
you have a, a, an explanation for why it's still. It's because it's so much heavier than the other guys, right? So, 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 so you know, this is back to you know back with Copernicus and all that, right? They've just known about naturalness, then they, they they would have been able to to sort of realize that actually it didn't make sense to talk about the the Earth as, as not moving. So it's this idea of small ratio, large or very large or very small ratios, don't really are unexpected and and they demand an explanation. And that there are many examples of of of, of these ratios in nature. Like we can be a little bit more precise about it. So there's, 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 there are many examples of these of these ratios that, that, that there are small ratios in nature. So let me give you one: um, the mass of the photon. We know that the photon couples to the electron. It talks to the electron. Electrons can you know, give off light. You know, and when you combine it with a positron, for example, they'll annihilate and they'll give off a photon. Um, so they talk to each other. So they're kind of part of the same ballpark in, in physics. Yet the mass of a photon, a particle of light, is far, far less than the mass of the electron. So it's in fact the ratio is about 10 to the minus 24. So that's a very small ratio. And I'm saying we're saying we shouldn't have large or small ratios in in because that's unnatural. So how do we explain that one? Well, actually, we can explain that one. The mass of the photon is, is actually zero, we expect. And that's due to a special symmetry in nature which guarantees that it's zero. Okay, there's it, it's, it's basically the symmetry which, which relates electricity and magnetism to one another. It's the same guy that, that is, it's called a U1 symmetry, and it and it and it it's uh, it relates um it, it guarantees that the photon doesn't have a mass um there's other examples there's there's the there's the you know we, we could talk about inertial mass and gravitational mass so inertial mass is that is, is your resistance to motion but there's also your gravitational mass um which is the amount by which you gravitate the amount of gravity that you cause so those are pretty much so you can take those are pretty much identical OK, they're identical to one part in 10 to the 13. Well, again, that's giving you a small ratio. So where's this this tiny number coming from? There has to be an explanation because, you know, my mass is not that small. Yet my yet the ratio of the difference between my inertial mass and my gravitational mass and my total mass is tiny. So there's this small number and we understand where it comes from. It comes from the fact that, um, you know, Einstein's theory, theory of general relativity and the nature of space time and general the, you know, the, the symmetry of nature under changing coordinate systems. This is where it comes from. It has an, an explanation. So whenever you have these small ratios in nature, they tend to have an explanation. So if we see a small ratio or a large ratio, we flip it over, of course, um, then we want, an ex we want to understand where it's, we don't, it, it feels unnatural. We want to understand where, it, where it's come from. And it feels like there should be some physics behind it. And so that's one of the dr main driving forces of physics in the 20th century. And it's been really successful. There's a very famous example of, um, of a, a, a sort of, you know, particle called a kaon. And um, it, what was realized is that, 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 that there's this, the difference between the masses of two kaons, two types, two different types of kaon, right? Um, the difference in their masses was very small. It was known to be very small. But actually, it was realized that this small number was, again, another unnatural number. It was unexpected. And there was no known, people didn't know what, you know, it, there was no, at the time, no known explanation for why, why this small number came from. So there actually is a Galliard and Lee, two physicists in the 1970s, they predicted that there had to be a new particle that existed that would protect, to preserve naturalness, which would explain the smallness of this difference between the kaon masses. And actually, lo and behold, a few months later, we discovered the charm quark, which was exactly the particle they predicted that would protect, the, which would preserve this, this, this small mass difference. So, so really there, that was an example where naturalness was used as a, as a criteria to predict the existence of a particle, which was then somebody they went out and discovered. So, so it's a really powerful tool. Is it, the, 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 this comes back to the questions we were talking about earlier about beauty in, in physics and maths, Naturalness is a beautiful thing, but it's not the ultimate arbiter. And ultimately, the arbiter is, is experiments. But it's it's certainly something we, we do use and we have used it with success to drive our, uh, our theoretical ideas. And we will do for as long as we can. Well, it's tempting to do so if, well, as it continues to be successful. But we are seeing some challenges to it lately. Mm. Great. Well, great for that overview. There, were, there was a lot there, but in the interest of 
time. Uh, do you want to discuss the, the size of the cosmological constant, uh, how it ends up um, kind of confounding the theoretical uh, uh, basis for maybe how large you might how large you might expect it to be, but now it, it's actually a lot smaller. I, I don't know how much detail you want to uh, to go into that. Yeah, so so, so I, can, I mean I can, I can give quite a high level view. So 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 the cosmological constant. So so what is this cosmological constant? So we talked earlier about dark energy. Now there is this. The universe is accelerating. It's, the expansion is growing quick, and there's something which we attribute to dark energy, which is causing that acceleration. Now what could that be? Well, the best model is that it's the empty energy of empty space. It's literally what we call the vacuum energy. So you would think that why is the vacuum got an energy at all? It doesn't really make sense to think that the vacuum's got an energy. You take everything out of the system, it's got nothing left. It's, got, it's not going to have any energy, but that's not true. Quantum mechanics teaches us that actually the vacuum's a, a really lively place. In fact, it's this bubbling broth of virtual particles popping in and out of existence. And those virtual particles carry an energy which, which we can calculate, okay? So we can calculate how much energy is in is literally in this vacuum, in the energy of the vacuum of the empty space. And so, so dark energy, some people think is this vacuum energy. And it's pushing the universe very, very gently. It's accelerating, it's just very gentle accelerated expansion. Now, but when we go away and we calculate what we think the vacuum energy of the universe should be, we find there's a massive discrepancy with what we actually see. So this is, let me just show you what the small numbers are. So I'll go into page 10. So if I look at what the observed value of the darker, so this, the, the way you measure dark energy is this, is this in this, um, well, let's call it lambda. Um, this lambda is basically, let's say it's 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 basically just Hubble, it's of order Hubble squared. Okay, so it's a tiny number. Okay. What's the expected value? So what's the theory value? What's the theoretical expectate expected value that this guy has? Okay, the theoretically expected value that this has, when you calculate the contributions from all these particles popping in and out of existence, this bubbling broth of the energy of empty space without going too deep into quantum field theory, you find that you expect this to be what's called the Planck mass squared. Well, this, the Planck mass, is 10 to the 120 times bigger than H0 squared. So this is way bigger. So now let's look at this ratio. Lambda observed by the lambda theory. So you look at it, it's 10 to the minus 120. So, so, so what we see is only a tiny fraction of what we expected to see. So this is what I'm saying. So the observed value is this, this Hubble squared value, this tiny number. The theoretical expectation is 10 to the 120 times bigger. So we've got this, this, this huge ratio, which we can't make sense of. Okay, we just, so we... Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe just to rewind a little bit, um, you talked about how the vacuum energy is significant from quantum mechanics. Now, um, what is true in general in physics is that if you just shift the Hamiltonian by a constant, that doesn't change the physics. So I'm a little confused. I mean, so you talked about virtual particles, but those sounds like excitations of the vacuum energy. So that's sort of like maybe the 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 second lowest energy state. So so why is it the case that the lowest energy actually affects these computations when, of, when of course, you have this translation uh, invariance, right? With, with, the, with the so I really am, I really am calculating the zero point energy here. So the, the language of talking about virtual particles popping in our existence. So when I talk about virtual particles, I'm not really talking about a particle I can hold. Okay, you cannot hold a virtual particle. It, 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 if, it, if you could hold it, it would become a, it would be a real particle. A virtual particle is really just just um, it's a way. Of, it's, it's, it's kind of it's a word we used really at some level to describe the sort of ambient quantum effects on, on, on the system right and so you can think of, of so it's not that you calculate the quantum corrections to the system and you can calculate what the quantum corrections to the underlying zero point energy of the system are so the, the literally the bottom line energy now you're absolutely right if i didn't have gravity i wouldn't care what that was in a world without gravity, I can move the Hamiltonian, as you say, the energy up and down. It doesn't make any difference. Ultimately, all I ever measure are energy differences. So there's this nice thing you can say is, is what is the vacuum energy 
contained in a coffee cup of empty space if I followed the, my nose with these theoretical calculations. Well, it's enormous. It's enough energy in principle to blow up the universe many, many billions of times over, right? Yeah. It's huge, but it doesn't do anything. Why doesn't it do anything? Well, one explanation for why it might not do anything in a world without gravity is that to do something with energy, you've got to really have energy differences. You've got to have gradients to move that energy around. That's how you create weapons. Right? You're going to start, going to start going to blowing up planets with this stuff. You need the gradient. But the, the, the thing about the cosmological constant or the vacuum energy, whatever you want to call it, well, it's constant. It's the same everywhere. So there are no gradients. So you're right. In a world without gravity, I could just move that Hamiltonian up and down, and it doesn't do anything. There's no physics associated with that. But with gravity, that's not true. With gravity, th this this guy goes wild. You you cannot you know gravity vacuum energy is just a form of energy, and like all forms of energy in general relativity, it gravitates. That's the equivalence principle. And so it does. It feels it. There's no way to decouple it. You cannot. Gravity feels it. There's no way to See, consistently. Uh, I'm trying to think about it. this. Yeah, I'm trying to think about this from a mathematical, uh, a succinct mathematical perspective. Can you think of it like, um, in in general relativity, you have the uh, whatever. It's like the uh, uh, Einstein-Hilbert action, uh, or, or uh, where yeah, it's the I scalar can, curvature. Yeah, I can explain very quickly about that. Okay, right. So let's take a look at that gravity. Yeah. So so here's my here's, here's like I've got my Lagrangian, which is describing. If we're happy to talk about that. The, which is describing my theory. It's some field theory Lagrangian. There's some integral over space time, and if I and then you can ask, what is the is the contribution from the vacuum energy? Well, it's just some minus v vac. So there's some of the stuff which is the the non vacuum pieces, but I'm getting this number v vac here. Okay, so I just get some integral like that. That's just a number. When I try to vary this Lagrangian, that guy's not going to contribute to anything. And this is that this is related to the fact that I can just move things up and down. And it doesn't really do anything. Okay, this is this is just a constant times the space times the integral over space time. That that doesn't that doesn't contribute to the the, the order of Lagrange equations, the field equations that result. Okay, that's what's true in a world without gravity. But in a world with gravity, this space time measure that you have in your integral, you can't have because it's not invariant under a change of coordinates. So what you have to do is you have to cope with something that's invariant under a change of coordinates. You have to. So this gets promoted to what's minus the square root of the determinant of the metric. This is G. This is this metric which we related to, you know, earlier on. We talked about the the, the um, you know this ds squared. So generally you can talk about this as being the sum over mu and nu, d, g mu nu to dx mu dx nu, and this is the determinant of that object. So for the case of Minkowski metric, it's minus one, 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 all along the diagonal of some four by four matrix. Everywhere else is zero. So yes, this is the Minkowski metric. It's like this guy. Yeah. Right. And I think, I, I don't know what physicists call it or, or even mathematicians, but I think this is called, is this called the Einstein-Hilbert action or is it like Hilbert Palatini? Yeah, or, so, or so, one of these names? No, so, so, so yeah, so, 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 uh, so yeah, so this 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 piece here isn't isn't the Einstein Hilbert action, but um but if I okay we can talk about it in a second, but but the point is is that now so that kind of the Einstein Hilbert part would be contained in the dot dot dots, which I'm I'm sort of not including it. But we're just asking how does the vacuum energy enter? So whereas here it didn't matter what it was because it there was it was just multiplying the d4x. Now it sees this. And so because it sees, and this is precisely because it's now we're now doing gravity. And because it sees this, this contributes to the energy momentum tensor, which are the the the, the source of Einstein equation. And so those guys, um, yeah. So, so 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 you just can't do away with it. Yeah, it, it contributes. Yeah. So it's actually so so actually it's not even a quantum effect. It's just the fact that your metric is now dynamical, and therefore it it couples to this constant that you normally would be able to subtract for free, but uh, but now you can't. The, your estimate for the value of what this is is kind of based on quantum mechanics. Then. Oh, I see. So okay, but this calculate, calculate what this is. But once it's there, yeah, indeed, you cannot. You you know it gravitates by Got because it. of this method. Yeah. yeah, I was just saying that, that. But classically, you can already see why you can't fiddle with that constant too much because of because of this determinant of g. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. I see. So so, so what's really cool is so, so for example. When when Wolfgang Pauli first first uh, you know was, was thinking about this back in the nineteen twenties, so 
he his theoretical expertise. So he realized this problem, right? This business that, that that whilst you can just ignore this zero point energy or this vacuum energy, you know, you know, but generally you might not see it generally for gravity. You've got a problem, and he realized this, and so he said, right, well, what if? No, he didn't. I've chosen the the Planck scale, which is this 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 sort of the scale at which uh, quantum gravity kicks in, as my as my estimate for the for the um, for the for the theoretical expectation of this vacuum energy. Um, actually, Pauli used a more conservative estimate. He used um, he he came up with a dis, dis, dis a different estimate based on the on the classical electron radius. And his estimate meant that, that um, so he got a much smaller value for what his theoretical expectation was, but he still had this ratio. He still had this, this, this horrendous ratio. And he, what he did was he calculated uh, what the effect of his vacuum energy would be on the universe. And he said famously, the universe would not even extend as far as the moon because what this large vacuum energy would do is it bends space and it bends it right back. Right? So it really bends space time right back. And so it shrinks the universe right down. And in, so for Pauli's estimate, the universe would be shrunk right back on itself so that it wouldn't even uh, set, go as far as the moon. For us, it's actually worse than that. Modern estimates are worse than that. It wouldn't even reach beyond, you know, not even as far as the atoms on the end of your nose. It would, it would be shutting it down completely. Wow. Wow. Okay. So this is a, a, a huge uh, catastrophic f failure mismatch between uh, theory and experiment. Um, so how do we think of this? So I mentioned the anthropic principle and I mentioned, uh, I guess, uh, there's probably many attempts, but maybe since you're on the podcast, you, you could talk about your your uh, work on uh, on the problem. Uh, yeah, why, why, don't, why don't we go there? So basically, this fact, so you can, you can calculate all these contributions to the vacuum energy, which I'm going to call VVAC. Um, and these these are contributing to what we call sort of the cosmological constant. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to just call it lambda total, which is the total value. OK, so you can say you've got your contribution from all these these this vacuum energy of the universe, but you can also add corrections to that. So just some and these corrections can come from various places. They can be some other fields which give you finite corrections or, you know, there are types of fields which can give different corrections to it or just different shifts that you can include but i'm just going to call that lambda bear so what i'm imagining here is, is that the observed value of the cosmological constant is my vacuum energy piece right which is this huge value so, so i've got this huge value which is this guy okay which is which is of order m Planck squared and um, this guy which is the total i'm going to require to be basically Hubble square. So this is tiny compared to this. And this, I add this correction to the theory, which can come from many different places. Um, and it's just going to be just the right value to cancel it off. That's the idea. This is very, now it has to be, you know, this, so typically this would have to be approximately minus M Planck squared plus H naught squared, right? So it's, it's, it's got to be M Planck squared, but not quite. Yeah. Right? It's got to be, right. be really, finely balanced it's a real fine tuning so okay. just a comment. So how so, that happens, yeah so so this lambda yeah. bear is the one that is the the cosmological constant that appears in einstein's equations or the modified einstein's equations whereas the v vac is coming from i guess the stress energy tensor where you can kind of shove extra terms is that how to think about this no it's the other way around so, so so i should imagine this is the thing this is the thing that's gravitating this is the thing you calculate from quantum theory and this is some coming from some other sector of the theory. Now, in string theory, there are sectors that can give you that. These can be different contributions to sort of some underlying vacuum energy, some underlying cosmological constant. They can come from from sort of uh, magnetic fluxes in compact spaces and stuff like that. They, they they can come from all sorts of places. But in string theory, this 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 is just some other sector of the theory which is giving you another contribution to the cosmological constant that you haven't accounted for. So this is your huge vacuum energy. Mm -hmm. This is coming from some other sector of the theory, and together they give you the final answer. Now you need uh, the final answer to be really small. You know this is big, so this has got to be just cancelling it, but not quite. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. That's a very unlikely cancellation. Okay. So the, what string theory does is it says, well, actually, there are loads of different possibilities for this guy. There isn't just one choice. There are actually loads. There are 10 to the 500 choices, if you like. 
all depending on how in string theory you, you get down from 10 dimensions down to four dimensions. There are actually many, many possibilities. Now, most of them do not have this choice. Most of them don't have this. Most of them will be, I don't know, minus five M Planck squared will be one choice. You know, in one universe, it's like this. In another universe, it's, um, I don't know, three M Planck squared. In another universe, it's root two M Planck squared. You know, there, there's all sorts of possible, but in some universes, it'll be this, right? So you've got tens to the 500 different possibilities. Because remember, this is coming from some other sector, some combination of magnetic fluxes or whatever. It's just some other physics. And, and this can happen in string theory. And you have all these possible choices that this guy can, this guy can take. Right. So, so, so to think about this mathematically, is it the case that um, uh, some modified version of Einstein's equations embeds into string theory, and if you sort of integrate out whatever the strings are doing, then as you vary the string theory specific parameters, which I believe in this case are different uh, Calabi-Yau uh, compactiv compactification Locking choices, the right? Then that once you uh, yeah, integrate those out, you recover Einstein's equations with these stringy corrections and and, and those different uh, choices yeah. give you these different values. Is that correct? I think that's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. There, I'm, caught, I'm, I'm storing them, all All those possibilities are in Lambda Bear. Lambda Bear could be a whole bunch of things. All these possibilities, 10 to the 500, let's say, for the sake of argument, 10 to the 500 possibilities for what that is. The vast majority are going to give you ter terrible answers for Lambda Total. If I took this one, I'm going to get minus four M Planck squared for the lambda total. That's not our universe. If I chose this one, I'm going to get uh, four M Planck squared for our universe, for, for lambda total. That's not our universe. If I chose this one, I'm going to get uh, one plus root two M Planck squared. That's not our universe. Okay. It's only these with, where this, where you have stuff like this, that it's our universe. Okay. Now, but that's not really, that's just saying you've got all these possibilities. And you don't really address the question. You say, well, actually, it's much more likely to be something else. Why are we this? Why are we in this situation? But now you start to think about anthropic arguments. So let's suppose we let's suppose we imagine we're in a, a situation where lambda bear is three m Planck squared. Okay. Vivac is m Planck squared, roughly. So lambda total is four m Planck squared, roughly. Okay. What would life be like in that universe? Well, there would be no life in that universe because the cosmological constant lambda, the, the you know the total value would be so large. This source of Einstein's equation would be so large it would bend the universe like crazy. Okay, in this particular case, the universe would be expanding really fast and really in an accelerated way. The accelerated expansion of the universe would be enormous, far bigger than we see. It would be so big that stars and planets could never actually form. You know, as, as quick as they try to sort of move together due to gravitational attraction, they'd be ripped apart by this, this horrendously powerful expansion rate. Okay, so they'd never form. So stars and planets would never form. And if stars and planets never form, then complex life's not going to form on those planets. And there's nobody around to measure this total, uh, you know, cosmological constant. It's not going to happen. That's also true if you took the root two M Planck squared. Again, you're going to get a huge total cosmological constant. It's going to rip the universe apart and planets aren't going to form. If you chose the minus five M Planck squared for the, for the bare value, for the stringy value, then the total value becomes minus four M Planck squared. Well, in that case, you've got a large negative cosmological constant. In that case, it turns out Einstein's equations predict that such a universe will crunch itself out of existence almost instantaneously. And again, the stars and planets never form. It's only in those handful of universes where the value of the bare value of the cosmological constant, this correction piece, where it's very, very almost precisely cancelling the vacuum energy piece. So when you, when you get this very, it's only in a very small number of universes where you get this very precise cancellation where lambda total is small, that actually stars and planets can actually form. They don't get ripped apart or crushed out of existence. They can actually form. The, 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 the corresponding expansion of the universe is gentle enough to allow them to form. You need that balance for it to happen. 
if it doesn't happen, if there isn't that balance, the stars and planets will never form in the first place. There will never be complex life. So our very existence is related to the fact that this balance was there. It's only in those universes where that balance exists that, that you can even measure. There's anybody ever anybody around to measure the cosmological constant. So this is the anthropic explanation. Our very existence guarantees that the balance had to happen. Now, string theory, for, for, for even to talk about these anthropic arguments, you need a multiverse. You need a situation where there are lots of different possibilities. I've encoded them here in this Lambda Bear. All the different, you talked about Calabi-R compactifications, all different compactifications of string theory with different fluxes and different this, that, and the other. And they give different values for Lambda Bear. And it gives you this, this landscape of possibilities. And so... You, so you might you might find the universe starts out in one possibility, which is completely in, inhospitable for life. Fine. But what happens then? Well, then you start to move through the landscape. So what happens is you quantum tunnel. So there's a mechanism, which is quantum tunneling, which allows you to move to a different phase of the universe with a different value of lambda bear. So a bubble forms within this different phase of the universe with a different value of lambda bear. Now, the total value of the cosmological constant has changed. Now, what is it? Is, it? is it a good value or is it a bad value? Well, let's say it's not a good value. It's still inhospitable for life. Stars won't form. OK, but then you have another quantum tunneling event and then the cosmological constant will change again and again. And, and you start moving through the landscape of string theory through all these different values of lambda bear. And it's only when you reach that sweet spot where the where you get that nice cancellation of values so that the total cosmological constant is nice and small, that the universe has the conditions, those Goldilocks conditions, which allow um, sort of complex life to evolve. And that's how we ended up where we did. That's the anthropic principle. That's great. I mean, uh, I, I guess, well, I guess the anthropic principle is, is a very general principle. What, what you described was a sort of a string theory incarnation of it, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, in the, uh, there's so many things we could talk about, but in the interest of time, do you personally, uh, what, what, what's your personal opinion on that argument? I guess some people think it's maybe, let's say uh, on one extreme, maybe unscientific because how could you maybe rule this out? Or maybe it sounds a little bit defeatist. Now, now, now we don't have to try to work harder to make things parsimonious. If we just have so many possibilities, we could just you know pick one. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think I think it's a bit unfair when people say it's not scientific. So, so famously, uh, Weinberg, Stephen Weinberg, um, back in the late nineties, he um, before the sort of observations of dark energy had been made, and he was thinking about what a cosmological constant might be, and he said, well, if we're going to explain the cosmological constant and its value, which he thought at the time was possibly zero, maybe he had some inside information, but who knows. But, um, but he said, well, we need, if we want to explain its value using these anthropic arguments, then between 60%, he had some argument for saying that between 60% and 80% of the universe should be made up of this stuff. So if its value is small for, and for anthropic reasons, then it must, be, it must make up about 60 to 80% of the energy budget of the universe. If it's not in that window, then we can't use anthropic arguments to explain its value. Well, what happened about a year after um, is that we discovered about 70% of the universe is made up from, from, um, from this cosmological constant. So, so Weinberg did make a kind of prediction there. Uh, and OK, the prediction came true. But, but the point is, is that it was falsifiable. Right? It, could, it could have not been true. Um, so, so I think that's why I think sometimes it gets a bit of a, a, an unfair press in terms of, in that respect. In terms of what I what I my my take on it um, is that I think one can explore other possibilities still. So one of the things I've been working on lately is thinking about still thinking about moving through the landscape of the string theory and using these quantum tunneling events, but rather than the so action criteria being complex life, one of the things that we've been thinking about is the selection criteria can be sort of probability and the probability you can start to attach try to attach probabilities for these different universes and actually we we found scenarios where if certain conditions hold certain microscopic parameters you know, satisfy certain conditions then we found that um you can have a situation where universes which look like ours are very similar to ours are kind of the preferred ones 
it's it's still a work in progress, and there are a couple of problems that that that's, we still have to to overcome. But that's the general idea. Um, so so again, you're still moving through the landscape of string theory, but but the selection is no longer anthropic; it, it, it's it's probability, which I kind of I feel a little more comfortable with. But you know, I it, there are some mild anthropics even there in, in what we're doing, but it's not quite as severe as the normal story. Okay, great. Um, I know you said uh, vacuum sequestering would be a huge rabbit hole, but maybe do you think you could give maybe the the one minute abstract version of what it is at a high level? Yeah, so so the vacuum energy sequestering, what it is is it kind of recognizes the the um, the unique feature of the cosmological constant compared to other forms of energy, and that's that it's so if you compare like the cosmological constant to the Earth, what's the difference? So they're both source Einstein's equations. They're both sources of energy and momentum. They're sources to Einstein's equations, but how do they differ? Well, they differ in that uh, the cosmological constant is everywhere in time and space. It's literally everywhere. It's constant in time and space. Whereas the Earth isn't. It's localized in space and possibly also localized in time because eventually there was a time when it wasn't here and there will be a time when it's not here in the future. So it is localized in, in, in time and space, whereas the, the uh, cosmological constant certainly isn't. And in fact, it's the only source of energy and momentum which has that property. So it's in some sense global in space time. It's not local in space time. It's global in space time. It's the only source of energy and momentum to, of energy and of, it's the only source of Einstein's equation which has that feature. So we recognize that about it. Thought, okay, that's what's weird about it. So what we're going to try and do is we're going to try to modify Einstein's theory, but only at the level we need to to deal with this cosmological constant. So the cosmological constant only rears its head at the level of the whole of space time. It's kind of a weird idea because it's the constant, it's it's the constant of space time in some sense. So we're going to tweak Einstein's theory globally over the whole of space time. So that's what we did. We corrected that. We, we we added an ingredient to Einstein's theory, which was not a local ingredient, which did not affect how it gravit how the Earth would gravitate or how the Sun would gravitate, which are local objects. It only affected how the cosmological constant gravitated. And so we were able to, by doing that, we were able to um, cancel off these these unwanted contributions um, without screwing. You can try to do this uh, without screwing up any of the great successes of of it. Of, uh, of Einstein's theory. And so when we did that, we we, we introduced that we added like a, a sort of a, a constraint to the theory, which was like a, a constraint over the whole of space time. It's almost like saying, it's almost like a thermostat, right? So you, you got a thermostat in your fridge, which says it's fridge has to be this temperature. And you can try to put hot things in the fridge, but the, the, the fridge will deal with it. It'll externally deal with it. Locally, that hot thing is, is its hot thing. And but the, the, the fridge will externally at a global level deal with this problem. That's kind of like what we did here. And in fact, the idea of temperature is quite a nice, a nice analogy because we really are sometimes talking about temperature of, of the space time you know, on a global level. But, but, but in some sense, what we did was we, we've added this external thermostat to space time, which is, which is external to space time, which is controlling its temperature, which is controlling the value of the cosmological constant. And it sounds a little bit acausal, and in a way it is, uh, but what it doesn't do is it create is generate any of these sort of pathologies that you would normally associate with that sort of thing. Uh, you know, there are no, there are no, there's no grandfather paradoxes or anything like that. It's, it, it's fine. We just fix one number externally from space time and, um, and, and it seems to, you can consistently cancel these away, these, these, these problems. Um, yeah, that's what it is. It's kind of, a quick summary of what it is it's 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 the cosmological constant problem is one of those problems where it's it's um you know it's 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 good to to survive it's 10 years since we originally came up with sequestering and it, you can't it hasn't been ruled out and i think that's that's an achievement because um generally with the cosmological constant it's theories ideas don't survive <laughs> right but surviving 10 years is, is an achievement whether it'll survive another 10 i, I don't know but but it would be nice <laughs> so yeah it's a tough problem great well that, that that uh thanks for that summary i mean i, I I'm, I'm not a, a a cosmologist so i I'll, I'll take your word for it that it's a very hard problem but clearly the fact that it's been open for for so long it you know uh it, it obviously must be a a hard problem um 
Uh, any final thoughts? Tony, this was really great uh, talking to you about so many interesting things in, in math and, and physics. Yeah, uh, no, just a, a lot of fun chatting to you. And uh, yeah, maybe come back when we, when we, another 10 years, when sequestering, talk more about sequestering if it still survives. <laughs> we'll see. Sounds good. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Tony. And uh, yeah, this was, uh, I learned a lot and this was a lot of fun. Thank you, Tim. See you. Cheers.